Uh, yes, we are Yo, welcome, welcome to this uh, pleasant evening. I'm Nakul Patil, thing as a product manager. We at MQR Iowa Division maternize our core brand and epitome of quality and success. Mm -hmm. We would like to thanks uh, to IRA team for giving us this opportunity to host this scientific webinar and be a partner for this uh, wonderful economic initiative. I especially, I would like to uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Ved Prakash, Dr. Sanjay Shukla and Dr. Charudatta Joshi for uh, arranging this webinar. And a uh, special topic is uh, no, the unknown, uh, the known and unknown tales of anocytes. Now, uh, I would like to, with me, uh, my colleague is there, uh, Rajeshwari. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to her. Rajeshwari. Uh, thank you, Nakul. Um... Good evening, faculties and uh, 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 doctors over here, embryologists over here. Just I'm going to introduce. Dr. Vay Prakash. So he is the lab director, South End Fertility and IVF Center from NCR. Uh, Dr. Vay Prakash is the founder of International Human Embryology Research Academy, and he is the past president of Academy of Clinical Embryologists. Uh, uh, doctor is also a faculty, having a faculty and fellowship in ART um, from Amity University, based out at Noida. And doctor has... We can yes. move forward, please. Only two lines. Okay. Thank okay. you. Uh, we have with us Professor Dr. Sanjay Shukla, sir, uh, the senior consultant embryologist uh, based out at uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi University, uh, Jaipur, um, working in the field of human reproduction since 1998. Uh, we have with us Dr. Charudat Joshi. Uh, uh, he has a special training in ICSI, IVF and sperm from uh, Belgium. And uh, sir has done a special training in PGD from Germany and uh, training in laser assistant hatching from Belgium. So Rajeshri, I welcome. Sorry, the... uh, so, Rajeshri, sorry, sorry to interview. Can you put uh, in a slide share mode? Thanks, thanks, Rajeshri. So I'm well. I would like to well welcome all the three of the uh, um, uh, speakers for to for today's program. So we have with us Dr. Sankit Dumal Satya, uh, senior clinical embryologist based out at Mangalore, uh, editorial board member of Journal of JBRA Assisted Reproduction, and his area of interest is male infertility and cryobiology. And uh, welcoming Dr. Rahul Sen, uh, currently working as a consultant embryologist in Nilkan Fertility, Jaipur, based out Rajasthan. Uh, he is the treasurer of ESA Rajasthan chapter and uh, uh, published papers in national and as well as in international journals. Uh. And I would like to welcome Dr. Akash Agarwal. Um, he is a scientific director from Hegde Fertility based out at Hyderabad, uh, member of national and international fertility organization. And his key interest is in cryobiolo cryobiology and male fertility treatment with surgical retrieve sperm. So once again, I'm welcoming you all for this wonderful session. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rajeshwari. And uh, uh, firstly, uh, good evening to all. And uh, on behalf of IFR, I would like to wish all of you a, a very happy new year. And yeah, today in this webinar, we'll be discussing in detail about the site. So we categorized into two lectures initially, one which deals with the setup logic features, and we have Dilip with us to talk about it, and uh, one extra setup logic features, which we have Gaurav Khan with us to talk about it. Then we have a panel followed by the, uh, followed the lectures. We have a panel discussion on the same thing. And uh, now I would like to invite the moderator for, moderator for the first session. Can you have the CV, please? Yeah, already introduction is over. Achara, sir, please take over. And I would like to ask you to introduce uh, the first speaker, Dilip. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of HIERA, I welcome you all. It is always a pleasure to be part of the event, and uh, it's always uh, useful for all of us. So today, the, uh, the theme is of oocyte, and we all know that everything starts from the oocyte. 
and the quality and the generation and maturity and so many things to be discussed about usai so for uh, uh, this i would like to invite uh, our first speaker dilip can i have the uh, cv please yes we are sharing yeah yeah um visible so yeah yeah it is visible now thank you so mr dilip kumar i would like to invite mr dilip kumar he is uh, currently working as senior embryologist with milan fertility center bangalore and studied human sperm extensively based on sperm kinetics with the help of casa and um, author chapters in infertility manual and atlas of human embryology and so on so many things to his credit so uh, it's presently executive member of academy of clinical embryology of india so without uh, uh, getting you waited for further listening to him i would like to invite mr dilip kumar all to you please uh, thank you thank you charles sir so shall i share my screen yes yes you can doctor okay Reset. Right. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, thank you for the IR uh, for the opportunity for to be on an academic session. So, everyone knows that uh, the oocyte is highly specialized cell, and it is very large cytoplasm. It contains uh, the stockpile of cellular material need for the development of the embryo so today i'm going to like discuss presenting about the cytoplasmic future of uh, oocyte oplasm and metaphase placed so this everyone knows that how the oocyte looks every embryologist every day they are uh, see uh, the the gbs or the m1 and m2 so every day it is like routine work so how the normal oocyte looks like so generally the size of the oocyte is around 110 to 120 micrometer and it is a completely nuclear maturity so uh, obviously when it become the m2 it is a totally nuclear maturity and round uh, clear zona pellucida and the small pellucidal space and uh, moderately granular cytoplasm this everyone know that how it is looks but uh, i'm more concentrating about how the cytoplasmically the oocyte look like so here when you go to the cytoplasmic parameter the oocyte oplasm cytoplasmic parameter so generally we observe there are fragile in the oocyte there is a granular there is a hcr and refractile bodies i think this all the routine part of the embryologist i think uh, even like every day it is very tough to say that quality of oocyte how it is look doctor says that how is the quality of oocyte looks that we need to say good if you say that so they say that every time you say the same thing so definitely the quality of oocyte helpful for the developmental competence for the getting the good blastocyst and pregnancy rate so we are going to one by one uh, briefly how it serve so coming to the granularity in the cytoplasm so so normally so normally when you see that uh, the how the, uh, the cytoplasm look is a fine uniform define the granulation in the cytoplasm so i think you can see the picture over here there is a very dense cytoplasm and here one more is a brown egg actually so uh, a lot of observation i seen in the time lapse image so the crystal clear cytoplasm and is very very important to manage entire organelle in the cytoplasm if there is a big granulation in the cytop uh, cytoplasm i think uh, see i say that there is a wave motion in the cytoplasm so there is a moment in the spindle there is a moment in the organelle there is a moment in the mitochondria so every moment the cytoplasmic wave motion is very very important for the developmental competence when there is a big granular in the cytoplasm i think it is really struck somewhere for the competent to grow for the blastocyst 
and you know, uh, one of the study i seen that high pesticides exposure have the high risk of granularity one of the, the one of the papers shows that the former using the more pesticides they have more exposure to the granularities and even cytoplasmic immaturation will be causes on the granularity increase the chromosomal aneuploidy 52.5 percent that study shows that the granulation will be causes and correlation of localization of mitochondria so so mitochondria is very very important as an energy source for the development when, uh, when it will be effect on localization of the mitochondria when there is a lot larger number of the granulation and even the patient age and uh, the stimulation will going to affect on the granular in the oocyte. So here you can see that the granulation and uh, you want definitely the embryonic development, the pregnancy rate and cleavage rate, birth rate, everything there is a paper shows that it will affect if the percent of granulation is too high. So some of the research reviews shows that the Ebinor et al. in 2008, there is a low fertilization rate and even 2008, there is a survival and impaired development after the cryopreservation because of there is impaired on the proper metabolic activities. If there is a bigger granulation, and even there are some paper says no correlation, but some paper says that most of the paper says that there is effect on the fertilization rate, embryo formation, and pregnancy rate. So then moving to the the aggregated the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So generally, it appears in the M2 stage and disappears in a PN and the pronucleus is slightly bulge, flatted, transient, disc like, and large cluster tubular smooth endoplasmic reticulum and surrounded by the mitochondria and the granular containing tiny vesicles localized in the centerplasm. So you can see here the center portion of the cytoplasm is the, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So generally, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is around 10 to 18 micrometer. Depends on the dosage and duration of the JRNH also causes the, the, the SER. And calcium activation, oocyte activation, abnormal mitochondrial respiratory activities. So when there is abnormal mitochondrial respiratory activity, it affects on oxidative phosphorylation and overall metabolic activation trigger in the oocyte. And so chromosomal segregation error, and abnormal cytokinase and microtubules and Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. So I think this is a major, I guess, shock by seeing that Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome is causes if there is a bigger percentage of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So these are the some of the the paper I go to that the there is a causes of the SCR. If there is a bigger SCR, there will be causes Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. So it will going to be affect on the like overgrowth and um, abdominal abnormalities, low blood pressure and increase the cancer risk. These are some of the problem I observed in one of the paper. So, so coming to that, uh, who said uh, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum cluster originate with the blastosis also, it will impair on implantation. So when you see that in the time of uh, ICSI, you need to segregate the smooth endoplasmic reticulum the granulation so that in that we need to segregate, we need to select the, which is the best oocyte or best embryo for the transferring. So definitely the, the endoplasmic reticulum, it will impair the implantation and you need to be take a special interest for the SER oocytes, right? So what is the cause for the egg to have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum? So when you see that there is a high E2 level could one of the cause for the SER formation. And even the serum E2 level on the day of SCG, administration was significantly higher in the SCR positive cycle. And what are the effect of the endoplasmic reticulum? Uh, you, know, you can see that uh, it will going to affect on the fertilization rate and cleavage rate, and it will going to positively affect on the pregnancy overall. So this is of endoplasmic reticulum. These are the, some of the picture where you can see the SCR, the centrally localized uh, SCR in the cytoplasm. And the literature review says that low fertilization rate, lower blastos formation and obstetric problem, birth weight, and even ICM formation in the blastos is also lower. I think uh, every time when you're doing the XC, please uh, segregate the things so that we can know that how, what is the development of competence of the East SCR or the granulation and all. Even the miscarriage rate will be going to increase if there is a SCR. And even normal development is very, very difficult a newborn with the free of the malformations. So here there is a 183 babies and in that 171 LP 
eight malformation, three neonatal death, and one still birth. So these are some of them. Then coming to the fragile cytoplasm in the oocyte. So generally, when you see the when you do the ICC, you can observe there is a funnel shape formation. So where you can draw up, uh, when you're coming back, you can see the funnel. So if there is a no, most of the time when you not create the uh, funnel, there is a term like fragile. You can see the degeneration. That means that oloma is not so resistant to like accept when it is not. It will make a bigger hole in that time. The cytoplasm will be come out from the the oloma and causes for the degeneration. So it's uh, responsible for the sealing breach, demonstration for the sudden breakage, and uh, no resistance upon the needle entry and co-exit with leakage of cytoplasm. So it will going to reduce when presence of the fragile cytoplasm, uh, cytoplasm, you can reduce the ability of the second polar body extrusions and subsequently decondense in the cytoplasm and forming the third pronuclei. So these are the loosely selectivity of the intact membrane toward the ion and other substance integrity. And even the uh, cytoskeletal complex affect the zygote ability formation with the, the fragile cytoplasm. So even the number of cleavage embryos, it will significantly go lower the more gonadotrophin administration may be one of the causes for the fragile cytoplasm and lower estradiol level on the day of SCG. So coming to the vacuoles, you can see that vacuoles, so maybe, maybe like you get a bit of confusion with the vacuoles and SEM. So your vacuoles is like a spontaneously and diffusion and uh, this is causes from the SCR and Golgi aperture. Surrounded by the membrane filled with the fluid, it should be generally around 14, less than 14 micrometer. And here you can see a formation of the vacuoles the vacuole can arise spontaneously around the extrusion of the first polar body. The vacuole can be formed from the pre-existing vesicles derived from the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi aperture. The vacuole can be generated unintentionally by the ICSI also. So these are the, some of the, the chances it will be. And occurrence and developmental consequence of the vacuoles. So there is shows that 3.9% of the chances of vacuole formation and when you look into the fertilization, normal and abnormal, there's a uh, 68 to 65% of variation. And uh, the vacuole oocyte have the blastocyst formation is keep it around 12.5% compared to the unaffected, that is around 50%. So when you see the literature review, so correlated with uh, the cryo survival and developmental of embryo will be go down and greater pregnancy, biochemical pregnancy, lower pregnancy rate. And some studies say no effect on fertilization and embryo quality, but pregnancy rate will be go down and even lower fertilization in some papers. So these are the some of the vacuoles. There is a single and multiple vacuoles you can see here. Then refractive bodies. So another the, the cytoplasmic factor, it is caused by the oxidative stress of the lipids and proteins, the then incomplete degraded of the autophagocytosis material. So this is a where you can see this is the one with the refractive body. And uh, so this is uh, lipofusion also we can call and it is once 570 to 670 nanometer in the size. So in that literature review, you can see that it's not going to affect on the fertilization embryo quality and implantation rate. Uh, some it, chances of it being going to reduce some of the pregnancy rate, one or two papers is shown. So, so these are the vacuoles, what I'm going to show you, the small dot over here, these are the vacuoles. Uh, sorry, refractive bodies. So then coming to the parthenogenetic activation, I think it's not in the cytoplasmic, but I just add on audio. So some of the key element causes the ethanol, calcium minophore, electric fluid stimulation, and M2 cell division, I vacuum pressure. So I concentrated, I ionic, these are the, some of the induced the parthenogenetic activation in the oocyte. So this is overall when you see that uh, how the, the cytoplasmic abnormalities in the, the oocyte. So right, so this still now you everyone every day you observe with the microscopic and inverted microscope what all what all till now I told you. But what about organelle? When you inject the oocyte, when you aspirate the cytoplasm, do you know that how many organelles will come with you and how, how going to its effect? So we need to go a little bit deeper that how the organelle will going to play the role in the cytoplasm and fertilization effect. So when we are taking the picture, like when you take in the, the oocyte in the, with a bigger like uh, electronic microscope, here you can see that distribution of organelle GB. In there, the organelle displays the non-homogeneous distribution. So in the GB, there is uh, the aloe formation. So organelle-free cortical area, this is aloe formation, disappears as oocyte re-enter to the meiosis. 
the periphery that is a 10 micrometer from the olama to the center ratio of the organelle density was significantly lower. So the, there is an, a GV and GV surrounded by the, or the organelle, there is a halo formation in the periphery. And you're coming to the M1 and this is the MO. In this two, you can see that the spindle positive M1, M2 site organelles were dispersed the homogeneously throughout the entire volume of cell except in the meiotic spindle. So once the nuclei, which is there in envelope of the, the GV where the chromatin condensed, once it is start opened, the all the organelles will be dispersed homogeneously throughout the entire volume. And the periphery to the center of the ratio of organelle density was significantly lower compared with M1 and M2. The major relocalization of the organelles occurred during the transition of prophase to metaphase of first meiotic division. So these are the, some of the, the picture where you can see here. So this is the, the GV nucleoli present uh, surrounded by the, the organelles. So mitochondria, Golgi aperture, endoplasmic reticulum, everything will be there. So then uh, once it is dispersed, you can see here the mitochondria, it is going to attach to the endoplasmic reticulum. So these are the, some of the electronic pictures where you can see that the overall organelle movement in the, the oocyte. So this is about the morphometric analysis of the, what is the distribution of the organelle in the position of GV, M1 and M2. So here you can see in the organelle distribution is very, very minimal in the GV where the most of the organelle will be concentrated near the, the center. So once it is moved to the metaphase one and metaphase two, you can see that the organelle density will be increased. So maybe there it is helpful for the activation and you know, for the process. So then you can see some of the organelles over here is the mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi aperture, lysosomes, so and the cortical granula and annulated one. So then coming to the major things, so when you are not major concentrated on mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi aperture, the most abundant organelles in the oocyte of all mature oocyte is the mitochondria because it is a powerhouse, it will give the more energy for the oocyte activation, oocyte activation, even the calcium oscillation once it is oocyte get activated. So generally it is a 0 0.3 to 0 0.7 micrometer. The average diameter is around 448 nanometer. So here you can see the, the mitochondria and here you can see that how the mitochondria are going to bound to the endoplasmic reticulum. So here M1 oocyte, the numerous mitochondria populated at cortical regions show the ten tendency to approach the randomly distributed ear structure. So it is a necklace-like complex formed variable size like a sac, ear decorated with the several mitochondria. You can see this feature in the ear that uh, ear is decorated with the mitochondria. Here on ear also you can see that. So it is a powerhouse where you can get the more uh, energy and this is about the Golgi complex. I don't take it too much here. Then you can see that uh, increase the organelle density is supposed to support resource and energy supply for the metabolic activity of haploid. So from the meiosis to mitosis. So once it is meiosis to mitosis, it requires a lot of energy so that organelle will be equally distributed in the, the cytoplasm. The mitochondrial population formed a characteristic complex with ER, which serve as a primary storage for intracellular calcium. So as I told that the mitochondria is a have the intercellular calcium where it will boost up, trigger the calcium oscillation for the activation of the oocyte. And the major feature of the oocyte maturation is accumulation of the organelles around the prophase nucleus. The collapse of the nuclear domain and fragmentation of the nuclear envelope at um, the germinal vesicle breakdown. The organelle dispersion toward the periphery of the oocyte during the metaphase meiosis one. The progressive integration of the, the Golgi aperture accompanied by the deposition of the, the CG in the subcortical, the cortical granula in the subcortical area. Gradually rearrangement of varial, the endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria complex. So then moving to the, the metaphase plate. So what is the metaphase say that all the chromosome, the pace or fully, once it is like a decondensed the, the, the GV, so all the chromosome pairs are fully condensed and attached to the, the meiotic spindle aligned in the center. So what are you going to see here? The center we call going to be my metaplase plate. Right, so each spindle was, uh, each spindle was, for, uh, sorry, each uh, spindle was further characterized based on whether all the chromosomes were aligned 
on the metaphase play or if chromosomes were misaligned. So misalignment was denote, denoted as any case where there uh, less than, like greater than two mm displacement, at least one chromosome from the metaphase or epithelial plate. So in the reconstruction of from the polar range, we define the chromosome D position as being normal when two set of the concentric array were apparent. If there was a deviation from this, as indicated by peripheral displacement and absence of complete inner ring, they were classified into. So then moving to here, you can see the picture where the confocal microscopic uh, image of the spindle and you can see the green is a meta, uh, metaphase plate. The, window, the spindle visualization change during the maturation. And uh, this is meiotic spindle where you can go to observe the spindle, meiotic spindle present in the next to the below the, keep it around 30 to 40 degree angle of the polar body. So the presence of the spindle is give the more the chances of fertilization. And uh, so the meiotic spindle close to the polar body was correlated with the fertilization and cleavage rate. High degree of misalignment between the meiotic spindle and first of all increase the risk of fertilization. Pregnancy rate was strongly correlated to normal morphology. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Dilip. Uh, nice elaboration and uh, very minute details are covered. Thank you, sir. Um, I would just like to ask you one thing. Yes. This all spindle and everything, this is, you also know that it's more of a technical and research kind of thing for a general general uh, uh, person working, like the junior embryologist or an embryologist working in a normal lab right. where they don't have access to all these things. Right. So what do you think that what he or she should see to satisfy or to tell question asked by the clinician that whether oocytes are good quality or bad quality? So what are the basic parameters you will see in a denuded oocyte so that you can label it that, okay, presumably, probably this is the better one and this is a not better one? So when you look into the cytoplasmic abnormality, like the oocyte oplasm, the major one is uh, granulation. What is the percentage of granulation? And uh, second one is uh, SER. And the third one is uh, vacuoles present. What is the percentage of vacuoles, whether it is a small or big? And what is a fragile cytoplasm? In, I'm talking about internal cytoplasmic characteristics. So these are the major things. Maybe we can note down and say that. Maybe like if you not land up with a good quality of embryo, maybe these are the, the cause. Yeah, so these are the characters which one can see even on inverted scope also exactly. on manipulator. Exactly. Correct. Yes. So, so what interpretation they should take out of it that they should tell what they should tell to the clinician. That is what is my question. Whether they are good, it's a bad quality or you may expect fragmentation or there will be no fertilization. So, so I'm saying that you will get a fertilization, you get a good embryo with all these abnormalities also. But getting the pregnancy is a big question mark over here. Correct. So that, correct. See that even though you're going to fertilize, you're going to get an embryo. So because of the pregnancy, we may like analyze why you will not get the pregnancy. Maybe like because of ACR, because of the vacuum, maybe this is the reason. Maybe we may not get the pregnancy. Okay. So <clears throat> why, why I ask you this question is because this is the question which was I'm listening from last so many years. The very first thing after pickup clinician comes and asks, how is the oocytes? Right. So I think this is probably the answer to that, that Okay, these are the things, so we so can expect that, fragmentation. I think to keep the evidence to show that we need to take every picture, every patient picture, Correct. to prove that. Because see, every day, if you say that who said quality is not good, not good means maybe patient feels bad that somewhere his uh, lab is not good. Finally, they put on embryologists. So instead, <laughs> I think we need to have the evidence of every patient and we need to show that this is the quality of who said. But Correct. if you think Correct. cytoplasm is very good, I think it is very like, we also very happy to do the exe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do we have any question uh, in chat box? No, I could not see any question for Dilip. Yes, uh, I have one question for Dilip. Yes, uh, uh, Firstly, to answer Charu sir's question uh, on a lighter note. Uh, and yeah, to answer the clinician, there are three things. Either the all are good, second is all are bad, third was a mixture, good, bad, and ugly. So these are the three answers which. <laughs> Having said that, and coming to the lips question, uh, you you showed a very uh, uh, beautiful picture illustrating the 
uh, organelles in the GV M1 and M2. So if you look at it uh, clearly, uh, there's a very clearly they have mentioned the number of mitochondria which is getting doubled in each stage. So how, how does that look? No, in GV, what is the differences between of my with respect to mitochondria with respect to yeah, GV? Yes, yes, I tell you. So mitochondria is not going to change its number. From GV to metaphase 2, the mitochondria quantity, it will be remain same. But major thing is the disturb, distribution of the mitochondria will be playing. So generally in the GV, it will be in the clusters of the, the germinal vesicles. Once it is the breakdown, then it will be dispersed, but there will not increase or decrease any mitochondria load in that. So it's not going to rise or decrease. It will be remain same from the GV to metaphase 2. Yeah. Uh... Just to extend the point, mm -hmm. uh, it only distributes with respect to the polar body as well. Uh, it is like bottleneck theory, which is already predetermined in the GV. Uh, mm -hmm. it is there, then it is sub-distributed with respect to the, uh, the cytoplasm and the uh, polar body, which is getting extruded. Exactly. So we are like abnormalities. So now I said that if it is a granulation and all, the proper distribution of mitochondria will not happen. Localization will not happen. So now, yeah. even though it fertilizes developmental competency, will so maybe like abnormality causes for the improper localization of the mitochondria and the other organs. Sir, there are two questions in the chat box. Uh, Charu, sir, would you like to take them? Sir, you are mute. So I can, I can. Yeah, sorry, you no, can, no. you can go ahead. You can go I ahead. Can I'll go ahead. So yeah. now, uh, so Jacqueline says that the OSET quality is average, but blastocyst formation is sometimes good. Our yeah. I say that even though sometimes OSET quality is good, you get a good blastocyst. What is the outcome? What is the pregnancy? See, any, any embryologist, we need to see that what is the final pregnancy. This, this is this is this is where I ask that question because once you label it that okay, madam, this, this yeah, this, are I also face so many times. Sir. Then you get no, a very no, I also face that. Pregnancy said quality is very average. We get a blastosis. Say that how, how you get correct. the blastosis with new set quality is correct, very correct, correct. So it all like molecular level, and even we need to see the what is the end result. The pregnancy is like ultimate, uh, even live birth is ultimate. So that we need to see that. Yeah, there is another question how to access quality of who said I think that we already have discussed. Uh, the, the characters which you will see in an M2 site, whether it's a good quality or a bad quality site. Any other point you want to add in yes, quality sir. of site assessment? So I think I majorly covered. Yeah. So <clears throat> if there is no other uh, question, can we close down this session? Yes, uh... Sure. Hi, sir. Uh, first of all, just wanted to interview. Uh, for this webinar, uh, total login is almost 600 login happen, and total registration for this webinar 476. It's a huge number. Wonderful, That's wonderful, great. wonderful. Yeah. great, great. Thank you. So, with this, uh, uh, for uh, such nice presentation and elaborate uh, discussion about this. So, hand over to moderator back for our yes. next. So thank sure. you, Charles, sir. Thank you for Aya for the the good academic platform. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Charles, sir. Thank you so much, Dilip, for that excellent uh, you know presentation. Now, okay, sir. Can I can I oh, uh, jump please. in? <laughs> so to answer a very um, I mean Shashwat question that the clinicians continue to ask us and what Charu sir was trying to ad address. Is that what we are seeing in the oocytes is just the morphology. Yeah. We do not know the potential, the competence of the oocyte. And maybe uh, like what are the abnormalities that we observe under the inverted microscopes like the ACR disc or the central granularity or the uh, extra cytoplasmic uh, debris and other features. Uh, despite all, there are two things which uh, uh, define the uh, fate of the embryo. One is that we often tend to avoid transfer of those oocytes, uh, those embryos which are derived from abnormal oocytes. So we do not know exactly. The other thing is that 
uh, it's not only the oocyte but also the sperm contribution and the patient's inherent uh, uh, characteristics or the uh, other features like endometrium and uh, certain markers and receptors and uh, biochemical dialogue between the oocyte and uh, embryo and the endometrium so all these things they define whether the embryo is going to implant or not so it's not just one line answer ki okay madam acha dikh raha hai aur ye to bilkul pregnancy dega so no one can answer this right sir is yes, rightly said and yes uh, we cannot generalize it because we are only looking at a morphological uh, part of it uh the competence is doesn't rely only on the morphology wise there are a lot many things which are internally like molecular level which has been involved over there which we really don't know as of now so having yes sir <laughs> thank you so much for that uh, uh, input and uh, yeah uh, rahul bhai akash bhai are you there uh, yes uh, sanket uh, thank you i am here but uh, sorry for my really bad throat uh, sanket if you can no problem <coughs> yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, so next I would like to introduce the uh, yeah of course Dr Rahul is the moderator next I would like to introduce the next speaker uh, dear friend Dr Gaurav Kant so can you have the CV of Dr Gaurav please yeah currently is working as a senior embryologist at Akanksha IVF center uh, he is the first indian embryologist to be certified by the both prestigious societies uh, uh, and uh, SRM and uh, uh, he is also certified by IFS and global fertility academy He has done. He has presented eleven uh, papers in ASRM, ST, and IFSS. He's a, and he is also a convener for SA Gynecology IFS twenty twenty two to twenty twenty two, and also uh, has done the same for like uh, for the years twenty eighteen and twenty twenty. And uh, uh, he is also uh, blastocyst biopsy and cryoposition training. For, he has obtained his training from Barcelona. Uh, without much further delay, I would like to hand it over to uh, Garo. Thank you, Sanket, for the nice. Uh... a uh, discussion about me it's always a pleasure to listen about me from you <laughs> so can i share my slides here please yeah thank you and is it visible to you yes please go ahead so so i'm a one who with you guys have done something uh, injustice because today i'm going to talk about something which has nothing to do with the baby at all it is something which is more like a carrier so what our dilip has talked about it is it is more like a satellite which revolves around in the orbit and gives the data but my data is all about the rocket which actually takes to the sky and deliver the uh, satellite in the orbit so whatever is there in my uh, ppt it is basically taken uh, from these three papers which are very well known and popular one is by laura rinzi the oocyte it is there in the ashray atlas second is uh, the selection of competent oocyte by morphology uh, morphological criteria for art by safet osturk and the third is the does morphological assessment predict oocyte developmental competence a systemic review and proposed score by alessandro uh, which is recently published in 2022 so there are lots of factors being uh, discussed by the uh, delip regarding the cytoplasm there are other factors also like the polar bodies on apelicida and the pervert line space which is i'm going to talk about so let's talk about the zona pellucida so zona pellucida is basically made i'm going to little basics which is which everybody we should also know that what are types of zona pellucida there are basically four types 1 2 3 and 4 so out of those the zona pellucida one is the one which is intervening between the 1 2 and 4 3 and the fourth is the last one it is basically secreted by the oocyte and the cumulus together to make the zona pellucida outside of the uh, oocyte regarding the function of the uh, zona pellucida the it started from the oogenesis to the acrosome reaction to the species specific sperm binding to the fertilization to prevent the polyspermia to embryo development and finally to the implantation and delivering the healthy baby to the uterus and helping it to implant so it starts from the primordial follicles only where the zona pellucida is a very small size thing with the, as the oocyte grows in the diameter from uh, 20 micrometer to the 80 or 90 micrometer the zona pellucida grows along to 1.9 micrometer 
So zona pellucida has a very specific function that it doesn't allow any of sperm to bind to it. Uh, uh, if you put the other sperm, they don't bind, but uh, the exceptions to human uh, sperm, like the gorilla and hylobates, they actually bind to the uh, human oocytes. This is a study which talks about and try to uh, find out which of the four zona pellucida is actually responsible for this species specific zona uh, binding of the sperm with the uh, zona pellucida. So they try to manipulate all uh, with the human versus mice at ZP1, ZP2, ZP3 and ZP4. And then mainly out of all the crux is that, that only ZP2 is the one which is species specific. And the other role of the uh, other like ZP1, ZP2, uh, ZP3 and ZP4 is basically for the acrosome reactions. So there is the end terminal of the, uh, of the uh, and terminal, sorry. sorry. There is an end terminal of the human ZP2, which is responsible for this. So there are uh, mutations also, as uh, Dr. Charu was saying, that we are not going to deep into studies when we are doing uh, more of uh, uh, lab work. Yes, it is there, but we can define them that when there are uh, mutations in the zona pellucida that can also lead to the fertilization failures or spontaneous conceptions. But a simple answer to is yes, we can go for the XC and achieve the fertilization. But what we, see, uh, what we generally see in the lab is uh, things like this, where we have a thick zona pellucida, a dark zona pellucida, or a septate one. So as per this study, what this says is, So as per the study, what they say is, is the oocyte having a thinner zona pellucida with a mean of around 16.6 .6 micrometer exhibit a higher fertilization rate, right? As compared to those which have uh, a thick uh, zona pellucida. So recently, the studies uh, from the pole scope says that when a, if you look at the zona pellucida, there are multiple layers, but if you have a thick inner layer that is around 10 to 12 nanometer in thickness, it gives a better pregnancy rate and a better outcome. This is again confirmed by the bioreferengence studies done by lots of people, even the, Dr. Ramaraju from India has also worked on it. Uh, Montag has also worked on it. If you higher referengence, bioreferengence on the inner layer of this zona pellucida, it's going to give you better results and give you better live birth rates. There are always a question in the lab when we go that there is a dark zona pellucida, is it going to be held? Is it going to uh, impact the development of the embryo? Is it going to impact the uh, hatching? Do we need hat Do we need to use the laser for it? The answer is no, it is not going to impact at any point. The outcome is same. The, there is no impact on the embryo development and the hatching or the implantation of the embryo. Although there are a few abnormalities on the zona which we have been seen, like the jagged zona pellucida. This is a study which tried to see these specific kind of zona pellucida and they find out that if you have these abnormal kind of zona pellucida, you come to a pregnancy rate of just 3.6% uh, when you compare to a pregnancy, uh, well, when you compare to a zona pellucida, which is absolutely normal around 26.6%. So try to rule out these kind of oocytes when you have in your practice. And especially these kind of septate zona, these are also in the form of uh, take a care, take a put in the bucket of the uh, abnormal uh, abnormal oocytes. Especially uh, uh, by the uh, uh, grading system by the ASB, what we follow is the Istanbul consensus, but there is also a Spanish guidelines which is much elaborated and more discussed. And they have, except for, uh, from taking the cell numbers, fragmentation, symmetry, multinucleation. They have also taken care of the zona pellucida and they say that if the zona pellucida, which is abnormal like jagged or they have septate, it should be considered B grade and not A, if the embryo is even A grade. So this is the uh, comparison of all these studies and uh, the all types of zona pellucidas by the Os, uh, uh, Safet Os book. If you have a thin zona pellucida, it is going to increase the fertilization. If you have a thick zona pellucida, it is going to increase the oocyte development. Embryo quality is increased. If you have a high bi-referengence, the high mitotic spindle visualization is there, higher fertilization rate is there, increased embryo quality is there, increased blastus formation is there, increased implantation is there, increased pregnancy is there, and even an increased live birth is there. So if you have a low bi-referengence, there is an increased miscarriage data. 
now moving to the parivite line space so the parivite line space is nothing but the space left by the zona pellucida outside of the uh, ulema that is it it contain the polar body which is the haploid set of the uh, chromosome excluded by the oocyte and sometimes it contains the debris which we sometimes see in our practice so what generally been seen is if there is a higher parivite line space that is somewhere associated with the sorry aging of the oocyte sorry so if there is a higher uh, parivite line space that means the it is associated with the somewhere the aging of the oocyte because the oocyte oulema or sorry cytoplasm sh shrink in somewhere and going under the aging there are also reports regarding the granularity of the parivite line space that if there is a higher doses of the hmg especially there are higher granularity and it is going to impact the development of the embryos like these kind of granularities so uh, if you have a granularity in the uh, uh, parivite line space that may impact and you may have poor embryo this is why i'm saying i recently underwent a patient where i have seen this kind of uh, uh debris as you can see there are lots of debris see lots of debris when i'm injecting the sperm even i was not able to see the polar body there were 12 oocytes and all of them were like this all that was able to fertilize them so they initially they you can see they used to look like this on the upper left hand side but this is a picture of the day 3 embryos they were lagging so i froze them on day 4 and they were on 6 and 8 cells and i'm still waiting for the result i have thought them and then transfer them so this is the conclusion by the safet which says that if you have a large polar body sorry large parivite line space there is a reduced fertilization rate reduced embryo quality uh, but the other study by 10 says that it is increased embryo quality the presence of glandularity the other says that the oocyte maturity increases but the implantation rate and the pregnancy rate decreases if you have a granularity in the parivite line space now the polar body so there are different type of polar body like if you the normal single polar body what we always want is sometimes you see a multiple polar body sometimes you see a enlarged polar body so polar body is basically a set of uh, haploid chromosomes so there are methods like some people even uh, select the oocyte on the basis of uh, uh, on the on the basis of genetics of the polar body also by taking care of by taking both polar body and looking the, under the genetic analysis and you can actually rule out the abnormal polar bodies and you can select the normal oocyte and then again you have the different type of dendritic polar bodies and you can come to it uh, according to abner the he says that uh, if the polar body even it is degenerating from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 different type of polar body like if one is the ovoid first polar body with smooth surface second is the ovoid polar body with a rough surface third is the fragmented polar body and the, uh, fourth is a huge polar body he says that there is no uh, there is a decrease in the uh, uh, in, there is a decrease in the pregnancy rate and the outcome is poor but the uh, more data which is coming out and uh, in 2006 some some paper came out and we they also compared about the polar body first second third and fourth and five they found that there was no difference if the polar body is round rough or degenerated it is not going to impact the outcome but the the most important thing is it should not be large and it should not be measurements too small so this is a picture of a multiple polar body so the e issue is here with the multiple polar body is when the polar body goes out of the cytoplasm it takes out single polar body takes out this haploid set of the chromosome right but when multiple are there there are chances that the other polar body might have taken the other chromosomes along so these kind of oocyte basically are leading into aneuploidy and then with that with the uh, uh, chromosomes also they are the oocyte is losing the cytoplasm cytoplasm losing cytoplasm means losing your uh, uh, atp contents and a poor potential for developing into a blastocyst so this is a conclusion by a safet that uh, if you have a intact polar body definitely the fertilization embryo quality uh, the blastocyst rate the outcome everything is nice if uh, and if you have a 
well shaped morphology everything is nice if you have intact and well shaped morphology everything looks nice but you have a degenerated the fertilization rate is less and if you have a large polar body the viability is reduced the fertilization rate is reduced and the cleavage rate is reduced at the end you have a poor outcome with the large polar body and multiple polar bodies so this is a conclusion by the uh, uh, by the uh, alessandro which I, I was talking about the main paper does the morphological assessment uh, predict the oocyte development competence and assessment review proposed basically he come to a oocyte literature score and he has given a score to all the parameters which is available that is whether it is relevant or not so uh, that's why i was saying initially that whatever has been given to me is actually injustice because or uh, zona panacea parameter and space polar body they don't have much value to give they the score is very less at the end if you look at the uh, studies which says that it has a positive correlation no correlation or negative correlation there are hardly good quality of studies which actually talks about it although if you look into the cytoplasm factors like the vacuolization the granularity and acr there are more component factors to talk about the oocyte quality although for me if i have to talk yes uh, the septate zona the jagged zona the enlarged polar body and the if there are debris in the parietal line space these are few things which might impact the blastulation and the outcome for the uh, cycle thank you Dr. Rahul, Rahul is on my stage. We both are ill. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, I completely agree, Gaurav. It was a wonderful presentation. But Sanket, by if you can continue the uh, moderation, yes. No problem. Yeah. Uh, firstly, congratulations, uh, Gaurav, for that excellent presentation. Uh, you covered, I think, almost all the points, but. Uh, i would like to ask you something about called uh, discoloration right uh, with respect to like a large pvs you also get a debris in pvs which you showed a beautiful like see, like see video where you, where you saw where you saw a lot of uh, debris in the pvs so what could be the reason possible reason for the origin of these debris in the pvs so there are few studies of uh, sanket which says that there is uh, if you put higher dose of gonadotropins the oocyte tend to release some factors which increases in the parietal line space the other studies also there which says that there are chances that the polar body is actually disintegrate in the parietal line space into multiple forms and you, they look like the precipitates so there is always a confusion but what i have seen in my uh, case all oocytes were like that so it is basic and i asked the uh, clinician uh, also but, uh, no uh, polar body wise uh, you can make it out right by looking at the color mostly the debris will be dark in color most of the times if you look at it uh, they'll be like when compared to polar bodies they're very much dark in color so if yeah, you yeah. can exclude them uh, not considering as polar I, bodies but, uh, I, uh, with respect to your last slide uh, where you showed a who site literature survey score so there uh, you concluded saying that there is no correlation positive correlation I with mean, respect to uh, uh, extracellular phages but if you look at the own data They, there is a positive correlation with uh, uh, ZP as well as polar body, which is not seen in cytoplasmic features. Which, uh, which one? Sorry, no, the ZP. Uh, ZP as well as polar body. It is showing a positive correlation with outcomes. They, And you don't is, see positive correlation with cytoplasmic features. It is slightly, slightly positive. If we have to go, I'll uh, the, have to go more than seven. If I look at the picture, I have to go at more than seven, which is more predictive. If they are dark, more than seven ones, they are more dark. So but but like uh, if you look at the uh, fun part of the study, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, there is no positive correlation at all with respect to cytoplasmic features. It is only polar body and ZP are showing positive. If you just go back to the slide, if you can. Ah, uh, sure, I can. And I think it's a very recent paper. I think. Ah, uh, it's a recent one. Yeah, just see the image. Uh, uh, positive correlations if you look at it the value of minus 1 that is zona zp and pb right and uh, you don't see that positive correlations with uh, the refractal bodies granularity color variation and other parts of uh, cytoplasmic features 
and also with respect to the number of uh, studies which analyzed is almost same with, all, with respect to all but the, uh, the 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 negative with no correlation is almost same in both of the them both of them yeah i found that very interesting because uh, in spite of that i don't know why they got the oocyte liter oocyte literature uh, score right yeah which is very less with respect to uh, extra cytoplasmic with compared to cytoplasmic features <laughs> Yeah, any other questions? Uh, Although I find it a very beautiful study to present because, see, when I was reading in the Ashray, the Atlas, I used to read nothing is important. Even granularity is not important. This is not important. That is not important. The uh, But if, when I look at the, if I have to give a conclude answer, then I found this study is giving me some idea that this particular thing two or three things are more important than the other things. Yeah. If I if I can jump in, hi, Goro. Nice presentation. Over there. Uh, yeah, on a lighter note, what Sanket Bhai is trying to say is we have not done injustice to you. We have given you something <laughs> which is equally important, first of all. You got it. And, uh, and uh, you have got an important one. And one more thing is, like you said about the study, that this is not important, that is important. Yes. That's a point to stress over there that there's nothing absolute. What probably right. all these studies indicate to us is there's not an absolute single feature which can show you that this is bad or not, right. given certain exceptions, like your polar body is present or not, might be a jade polar body, and someone might be like SCR. And uh, these papers, I think Thomas Sebner had put up where he said almost 40 to 50% of the oocytes will at least have one of the abnormalities. I agree with you. And uh, uh, so that means there's something much more going on, much more complicated than absolute yes or no. I think that's the gist of these studies. I agree. I agree. Akash, I presented a paper way back in 2011 hmm. where I presented, where I put the B-grade embryos in one patient. So sometimes we have B-grade embryos, right? The number is less. Yes. Those yes. compared with the A-grade embryos we put. So even those B-grade embryos have a live birth rate of around 8%. Yes. So we cannot yes. deny that. Yes, so it is. It, it, I can also give you a good blastulation and a pregnancy rate. We don't know it. Right? Grading is arbitrary. Grading is done by humans, not by nature. So that's yes, where the arbitrariness comes in. Right. Yes. Let us not get into get into more details because we have a panel panel discussion, which is uh, lined up. So we'll discuss in detail over in the panel discussion. So thank you so much, Gaurav. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you, Ayara. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rahul, and thank you so much, Dr. Garo. So without much further delay, uh, we'd like to start the panel discussion. Uh, can we have the CVs, please? CVs of the panel? Yeah, sure, sir. Hmm. Sure, sure. So I have Dr. Rakash with me as a co-moderator for me uh, for today's uh, panel discussion. And we are very esteemed uh, panelists with us. And uh, of course, none of them need an introduction. Uh, can we jump to the uh, panelist? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, first we have Dr. Manisha Vajpay, a dear friend of mine who is currently working as a director of scientific research and embryology department of clinical embryology and molecular biology, Pacific Medical College, uh, Pacific Medical University, Udaipur. And uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Manisha. And next we have uh, Mr. Balakumar N.P., who is a SRM certified uh, embryologist and is, is currently working as chief embryologist at SRM Institute of Medical Sciences, Chennai. And uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Bala. Next, we have, yeah, uh, again, dear friend of mine, Hemant Kumar, who is currently working as scientific director and chief embryologist at Genia Fertility Center, Bangalore. And uh, he has a 12 years of experience in as a clinical embryologist. Welcome, Hemant. Thank you, Zinkin. Yeah, next, we have Nancy, uh, Nancy Sharma. She is a chief embryologist and lab manager at the Department of Reproductive Medicine. And she is an ASRM certified embryologist and also certified uh, from ASRM in fertility preservation for reproductive health providers. Welcome, Nancy. Next, we have, of course, uh, Ved sir and, uh, Char and uh, Sanjay sir. I think already introduction has been over. So I would like to invite you all for this uh, wonderful and interesting panel. So now, uh, Dr. Akash? Yeah. Yeah. Start, please. Yeah. I'll just share the screen. Yeah. Yes. So uh, thank you, Ayra. Thank you, Ved sir. Thank you, Sikhet Bhai, for uh, making me a part and giving me a chance to moderate this session. And uh, we have a wonderful panel. Hope it would be a quite interesting for all of you. Uh, we had a discussion about the extracytoplasmic features, the cytoplasmic features, the metaphase plate, 
and how it is important. We probably all of us know what is important to a large extent, what is proven. So we'll be taking you through our slides and just a slight warm up based on what we have already got. We, are, we know that we were just discussing some time back that how the embryo grading, what we do is not all uh, informative over there in terms of the pregnancy potential and the life birth potential. Similarly, when we say the quality of the embryo, we tend to associate it with the morphological grading, what we are giving over there. And what impacts the embryo quality as such majorly is your gamete quality. Yes, it includes your stimulation and other parts as well, as well as your lab conditions, the experience. There are so many variables agreed, but majorly we can say if there's one thing what is put up, what is responsible for the pregnancy as such, it's probably the female gamete. The question like we had seen previously, the moment OP is over, clinician comes in and asks two questions. We get probably, kaise hai, kitne hai? These are the two questions that we commonly get. How many you have got and how do they look like? So probably your oocyte quality is not only what we look at, it's not just the nuclear and the mitochondrial genome, which we have seen how it can affect the competence of the oocyte and the developing embryo as well. But probably it's much more of a complex interplay which is going on in the development of the oocyte. A oocyte, you know, which is formed probably 20 years back during the fetal period, and it is lying dormant over there and it becomes active. One of few of them become active, developing by the microenvironment, which is provided by the ovary, the pre-ovulatory follicle. There's lots of transcription going on, translation going on, lots of organal changes which go on. And these translate into the cytoplasmic maturity, which we assume we know of seeing under the light microscope. So the elusive search always starts with the arrival of the very first follicular tube, which comes into the embryology lab scan for it, scan for OCCs are there or not, that frantic search, let it not be without anything, without any OCCs. And helping us in this, what we have seen already, that there's a SJ which has classified in terms of your extra and intracytoplasmic dysmorphisms and your extracytoplasmic dysmorphisms in terms of first polar body morphology, your PVS, your discolorations, your ZP, your shape anomalies, which could be there. And they are the refractile bodies, the central granulation, vacuolations and SCR, as I've already been discussed. So with these warm-up stories, we would like to take further some things which we probably tend to overlook or probably we tend to not give that much importance in the lab. Yeah, what we thought of uh, doing it is like uh, you know, breaking the norms, like routine. We uh, post a question and we uh, show a lot of data uh, according to, I mean, which is related to that. So we thought we'll have a little different kind of discussion. And... Uh, uh, yeah, there are a lot of arrows which are like around uh, eight to ten arrows with us, we have, which will be shooting on the panelists. And I think they're all well equipped to with a shield and to bounce back with their answers with respect to this topic. Yeah. And these arrows are not meant to hurt anyone. This is just to guide them where the persons have to look into. So going with the first arrow, how does the stimulation affect the outside? Just now we were, I was saying about it affects your oocyte is affected to a lot of extent of how very develops for stays for major time of it. So what experiences we have in terms of how the stimulation is going to affect the oocyte quality. So we can start the panel. Anyone can take the question. Please. I'll take the question now. Yes, yes Simon, please. Just we all know that uh, there is no control over stimulation uh, that is no it is compromised the oocyte quality in the various aspects. We look at the you know um, stimulation protocol where you no know, the standard uh, protocol it will take ten to stimulation protocol it will take to ten to twelve days and the gradually the size of the follicle is one point seven two mm in each day it is it has to develop that is the normal ideal way in some of the cases you no know, we were in the unknown phenomena the stimulation is going behind uh, and uh, and using of more HMG. In those cases, you know, uh, it, uh, we, it, the corset quality is going to uh, compromise uh, where exactly in the large, uh, large peribodylin spaces, maybe in, you know, in those cases, the stimulation could be in behind the days. And uh, as in the discussed in the previous session, the lot of uh, debris is present in the PV, uh, PVS is because of the patient is not uh, response properly. In those cases, maybe administrative of more drugs that can cause us you no know, HMG as well as um, more drugs causes the uh, increase the pervidin space as well as the uh, debris we can see in the pervidin space. And uh, uh, where in the stimulation uh, uh, starts, 
to in the protocol estradiol levels which is not correlating the uh, follicular number that also compromises uh, you know the oocyte quality okay so we have seen the duration of the stimulation the dose of the stimulation so anything to do with the protocol that is followed say your antag versus agonist or the dose which type of fsh is used rfsh is used or whether you use highly purified fsh so any differences you have seen i mean uh, i don't want the ones which are there in the paper yes there are many papers which say but anything which you have seen personally any differences since much yeah in the compared to this one now it is all uh, short protocol is more no uh, uh, well established compared to the uh, yeah. agonist antagonist is most commonly using now and uh, you know uh, clinically and uh, gene level you look at that uh, it is suppressed the uh, no um, uh, what exactly the point you no know? maturity ha uh, maturity as well as maturity as well as the quality the granulation it is a part of you know uh, uh, control over in stimulation it is a part of uh, in uh, stimulation protocol but when in the long ago you know uh, and uh, agonist protocol where we seen you no know, increase the permeability spaces more the time which causes a post maturation we say we say where the uh, cytoplasmic will be shrunken compared to this one so now it is easy level level antagonist protocol it is always you know, good and more, more effective or even yeah. you know that uh, uh, that there are so many ways of doing the uh, stimulation but i think we should uh, endulize the protocols so uh, according to the poor responder or higher responder these kind of patient have different kind of uh, should have different kind of protocol so then uh, it will be better to get the oocyte quality will be better because the there are so many patient of endometriosis and other kind of uh, uh, abnormalities are there so uh, in these cases definitely you will get uh, bad oocyte quality so uh, at that time you have to when whenever you start uh, stimulation protocol you have to take these points uh, under uh, uh, consideration that uh, what kind of patient is there yeah. according to that you have to follow the stimulation to get the better quality of oocyte and, and also uh, the history of the patient and uh, uh like uh, in embryonic status i'm telling uh history of this embryonic uh, status and all uh, the clinicians can plan the stimulation protocol so that we can reduce the risk of getting um, like any abnormalities in the oocyte so because now we are not sticking in the uh, like same protocol for all the patients we are having a different protocols for the different profiles so we can uh, like uh, we have to uh, plan this uh, cycle like it depends on their history of embryonic status also yeah so uh, the gist of what we could get is it is it has to be tailor made probably personalized individual okay, yes. protocol uh, and uh, charu sir yes i see charu sir hand been raised awesome. i was coming to her yeah yeah, yeah I, i i would just like to add here this uh, stimulation protocol decision uh, the very important part plays is by the endocrinology lab because our all this uh, assumption and stimulation strategy depends on the endocrine levels of the hormones so i feel that uh, before stimulation we should have to stick to quality in endocrine uh, evaluation of the patient what are the values of the hormones and then accordingly that may be one of the deciding factor which stimulation protocol that patient needs and, uh, yes it is everything like already said by sir you have to sit in the endocrine parameters as well because your decisions are going to be based on that and if the data what you are going to make your decisions on is wrong then obviously your stimulation may get compromised yeah, because, uh, because i have i have very commonly seen this that e2 values never correlate with the what is the finding seen under ultrasound and what you are seeing it's always already di- al- always different so so that is what i mean that the endocrine function and endocrine testing should be given that much importance before uh, starting with the stimulation protocol or selecting a protocol uh, here i would like to add one more thing not only the endocrine profile sometimes actually it uh, actually it happens because different labs will give us a different kind of uh, like uh, values for the same patient but uh, before starting a stimulation the basic um, um, uh, basic enteral follicle count 
and also means these small small things can make a huge difference uh, that, that is a, a good uh, sonography on day 2 and basic enteral follicle count also have an impact because uh, we get uh, hormonal variations um, at times so these things are that is the only thing i would like to add to this sometimes so, amh is also not matching not uh, but afc can give us a clear cut idea okay yeah. what we, so age. it's like re rely more on what you see directly rather than depend on something else oh. so rely more rely more not totally it's more rely more on what you see directly. and yes. uh, it's afc in combination with the amh which AMH. are the best indicators as of yeah. now which yeah. are the present indicators right. personalized protocol Get your lab, which is standardized. I think, I think, keep it at AMH, keep it at is, one again, lab. AMH is again a topic of debate because <laughs> it's not a very true indicator of a reserve. Yes. So, so we'll not that's why. But I think we'll not get into those details. Paper, I think it's that's why combination. One, uh, recently, there is one paper which shows that uh, AFC and AMH. Yes. Are, uh, combined, combined together will uh, combine. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, that's what I would. Uh, that's what I was uh, saying. So precisely the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. So uh, one last point before we move on to the other question. Probably it's a stimulation protocol also play definitely some role in our yes. treatments getting better, and that's why we are seeing our pregnancy rates getting better. So it all starts from there, not once it enters inside the lab, but rather from there, the patient selection and the stimulations, all of them. Yeah. Can we move on to the next question? Let's... Yeah. Yeah. Coming to the arrow number two. Uh, well, what is the most important factor in oocyte quality uh, other than the nuclear maturity? So we tend to uh, incubate the oocytes once the OPE is over. Uh, we 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 normally incubate the uh, oocytes before the IVF or uh, ICSI, whatever. So what could be the reason for that, and uh, what is the another most important factor apart from the nuclear maturity? Anyone can take up the question. Yeah, uh, as like uh, we all like got uh, so many information about cytoplasmic and uh, extra cytoplasmic uh, uh, parameters. So other than nuclear maturity, uh, we'll be very focusing on this uh, cytoplasmic and uh, extra cytoplasmic parameters uh, to assess the oocyte. And also uh, uh, the speakers have mentioned uh, about uh, uh, the uh, parameters of uh, extra cytoplasmic uh, parameters, which is uh, uh, correlating with the uh, oocyte quality and also the uh, progression of the uh, um, uh, progression of the oocyte and the embryonic status. So we'll be like concentrating on the uh, both parameters other than uh, nuclear maturity. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, sir. That you know that nuclear other other than nuclear maturity, there is so many factors uh, we can uh, say about that. There is already two uh, speakers told about so many things uh, to us uh, uh, that uh, Jonah and uh, uh, you know that polar body and everything. Sir, I knew this. So I knew this. All the intracytoplasmic and extracytoplasmic. Yeah, no, no. I, I knew this that the speakers are going to cover this very topic. So I. Yeah intentionally deliberately i put most important factor apart from nuclear maturity <laughs> so that we can streamline yeah. to uh, one particular factor uh, what what each one of you has found in your personal yeah. experience that this more to do with that than, than polar body polar body yes sir cytoplasm is so broad Who's term i would say Actually, so granulation, uh, whether it is a central granulation or easy, um, equally distributed homologous cytoplasm, means everything is important. How can you rule out? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it is very uh, difficult. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. For telling you that polar yeah. body. Actually, Dr. No, Manisha, I think Manisha ji, what happens is, what yeah. we would like to get the answer is with respect to what yeah. do you consider the most important factor apart from that? Everything. Yes, you know that. Everything is important. Yes. Yeah. Apart from nuclear maturity, what do you think the next most important factor that has to be considered with respect to the maturity? So, yes, as I yes. said, yes, everything is important. But which is the most important factor apart from the nuclear maturity is what we... From, like my, to... from my point, I can say, see, when we are having granularity or distillation of the cytoplasm or vacuoles or anything in the cytoplasm, at least we can show them and we can explain there is something is there. We can call it as abnormality. 
when from my point I'm, i i can say the perivitlian space is the biggest thing that we can't handle and deal with it because we, uh, we can't say just like that uh, doctor we got all losses or large perivitlian space so that we had a poor fertilization or that is the thing so but that is the factor uh, papers are showing uh, results in uh, like there is a correlation between perivitlian space with the low fertilization and the grade 3 embryos and all but that is the i think from my point perivitlian space is a big deal uh, for us great i think uh, uh, sanjay sir is with us sanjay sir yes 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 so please so, uh, actually i'm driving so <laughs> i'm not sure whether i would be able to focus on my answer or not but one <laughs> thing which uh, i would like to convey is that all these feature we are observing Uh, when we are denuding the oocyte, that means we intend to inject the sperm, and it is not meant for the regular IVF insemination. Right, sir. So now there is a hell of difference between a regular insemination and the oocyte quality that we observe before it see. You hardly see many abnormalities on day one of your regular insemination. <laughs> so this gives me an idea a suspicion that most of the abnormalities not most of the abnormalities but at least few of the abnormalities are actually created by us and artifacts of the handling before we inject the sperm for example the shape of the oocyte so you say the ovoid is not good or the uh, fractured zona is not good or the uh, you know the septate zona is not good sometimes these may be because we have handled the the oocyte maybe in an inappropriate way or the oocyte was not tolerant to those stress so that is one point and another thing is which apart from the cytoplasmic maturity uh, during it see what we observe is first thing is the elasticity of ulema yeah so the elasticity of ulema and then subsequent uh, cytoskeletal uh, strength of the oocyte so if you see an ulema which is uh, very elastic you are not able to pierce it through or it is too less elastic that you can just uh, pierce it without any resistance so both the cases the outside quality is not good in my opinion and if the uh, microtubules are not well formed uh, again the oocyte is going to collapse and it will be just right yes one last point uh, one last point again yes yes sir the 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 question frame is no i like the question framing is what is the most important factor other than the nuclear maturity on lighter note for embryologist the nuclear maturity is very important yeah. because the nuclear maturity is where, you know it is like uh, it is not you know when you see the more uh, immature oocytes then the question will arise and ro will come to you your denudation of the time incubation of the time and ultimately the questions is arises for the skills of an embryologist so nuclear maturity is very much important uh, as per concern is the uh, oocyte assessment apart from that as uh, i strongly agree with sanjay sir which is elasticity of the ulema when you doing the icsi what we learn in you know the form the funnel shape towards the center that is shows the cytoplasmic maturation how uh, big funnel it forming how less funnel is depending upon that we came to know that you know what what Uh, the oocyte uh, cytoplasmic maturation of this particular oocyte it may be different from each individual oocyte but apart from that uh, i think uh, i strongly agree that ulema uh, elasticity it is very much important yes sir yes sir rightly said yeah uh, yes uh, to conclude the question uh, yes uh, 
first starting with uh, uh, Dr. Manisha, yes, she rightly mentioned that everything is important apart from the nuclear maturity, yeah, including all the cytoplasmic features as well as extra cytoplasmic features. Along with that, uh, I also agree with uh, what Bala said. Uh, yes, it's uh, PVS also is uh, more important. And also Vetsar mentioned about polar body. That is also very important, which we cannot uh, uh, ignore the very fact that the morphology of the polar body and the outcomes. And similarly, what I strongly agree with Sanjay sir also, yes, most of the things since we denuded the USAID on the day of OPU and we get to see a lot of things and these are we have created it. So we don't exactly what happens with respect to in vivo USAIDs as well as those USAIDs which have kept for IVF insemination. Maybe this is like uh, maybe most of the things which have don't, there is, there is no straightaway correlation with the outcomes, but still uh, it's, and finally the ULA is one of the most important factor, uh, which we don't get to see uh, and by just by morphology. We get to see only by doing ICSI, so the, yeah, which is the extension of the uh, extension factor apart from the nuclear maturity. So having said that, yes, uh, it was wonderful uh, to all of you that uh, no, you got you gave a lot of inputs and a lot of new things that have come up. So I would like to proceed to the next question. Yeah, uh, Dr. Akash, you are taking this question. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, are we on the same page, like? Still, morphological reading is the gold standard. We have seen the two talks and the first two questions about the morphology and stimulation protocol. So is conventional morphological reading still the gold standard as far as suicide quality is concerned? Or we have any difference of opinion over here? I think Nancy is sitting quite for some time. We can shoot. Yeah, shoot Nancy can, yeah. yeah so for now, it uh, it is that we are stuck with uh, stuck and confined with the uh, subjective morphological evaluations and morphological and the maturity of morphological evaluation and the majority of the oocyte. Uh, to that, I uh, I want to just add, yes, I am going with the uh, gold standards, which is the morphological grading for first, because I can see that in the very first day on the lab, that what is the morphology, morphology of the oocyte and is it mature or not? But yes, other factors are also there, uh, like the biomarkers, but we are not going to see them. We are going to only see the mature you, you uh, to, morphology. You, you, you mean to say, that you are doing straight away all ICSI, no IVF, all right? Yeah, no, I am doing all, uh, I'm also doing uh, IVF, but true, in a few true. cases, uh, we, have, uh, follow XC, uh, we follow XC for uh, most of the cases. Yes, the morphological grading is still the gold standard. And uh, see, if I talk about the COC grading also, uh, if I'm doing the binary system of the COC grading, I'm not going to uh, lose anything to that. I uh, I will add that if I see a compacted uh, COC, I mean, I'm not I'm not sure it is uh, immature or mature. It After denudation, I can uh, know that if it is mature or not. And if I'm doing IVF to that, I'm anyways going to put it in the IVF for examination and uh, going to see it the very next day. I'm not going to throw it. I'm not going to is going to be used. So yes, the morphological grading for sure. Yeah. So uh, I just want to ask as a question for this. So are is anyone following an individual oocyte for this when you are grading them? Are you grading them as a cohort together? Or are you grading them individually and following them till say day five or say till transfer as well? Nancy? So uh, we do both because uh, when a cohort is, all the cohort is affected by something like the, the perivit line space is abnormal or something which is abnormal in all the oocytes, we mark that, we note that. And if we see something very unusually abnormal, that is um, SERs. If I see SER, I would definitely want to uh, I would definitely want to tag it to uh, tag it to that particular oocyte that yes, we saw three or four oocytes with SER. And this is the grading of it. This is the, how they are going to develop further and what is uh, the final uh, outcome out of it. So we do both for that. So uh, anyone following, I wanted to ask like on a regular basis for each individual oocyte, this is yeah, the oocyte which uh, was there. While, while it, while actually, we are not considering uh, the separate uh, oocytes that we are uh, doing mm -hmm. ICSI, but uh, yeah, as uh, Dr. Nancy said, we'll uh, see the cohort of the oocytes. But when we are uh, seeing any abnormality, that specific oocyte will be cultured uh, separate and will be monitoring. And also that that uh, procedures will be followed like separate only, like freezing or uh, anything that we will write a comment on this particular oocyte as this comment like that uh, we do. Uh, uh, and uh, the question like conventional morphological grading, yeah, that is actually a gold standard method because all embryologists will face this after immediate uh, oocyte screening that clinician uh, 
uh, our doctor will come and ask how was the cumulus how if you, I, they'll ask how many number of sets we got and how it is then immediately they will ask is it expanded it, it is like uh, look like m2 or what so obviously that uh, morphological grading uh, should start from that point so it will be a gold standard method only Right. So, uh, uh, Mutula, any uh, other uh, uh, morphological, apart from morphological grading, any other way of uh, grading the uh, oocytes? No. No. Because really all can. other methods are invasive. You can't, uh, we can't use them in embryology lab. If you are uh, talking about gene expression studies on all those things, they, yeah. are, they are definitely more <laughs> conclusive. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we can't use them. Uh, in our lab, we have to stuck to the morphological gradings. Recently, I have shifted to individual uh, like grading of the oocytes and individual uh, uh, single droplet culture. And probably that I'm finding it uh, more conclusive. Actually, at times uh, we got to see uh, oocytes which are looking quite uh, uh, quite bad. Uh, I've graded them badly, but I got good blastoses out of them. And those things are quite surprising. And they are the main points where we are stuck, why it is happening. So um, individual... Culturing or individual grading is really, really helpful if you can justify with your workload, as Dr. Akash. We so, are doing so, uh, individual grading uh, in our uh, system, but uh, culturing uh, all together, not such okay. and separate. But, but if you <laughs> find any specific <laughs> thing, so you definitely can't... I culture them at, uh, in other drop, not in uh, yeah. single drop, like yeah. what we are doing. So, right. Anybody has experience with, uh, since now a lot of uh, AI things are coming up, with respect to selection of the embryos. Similarly, there, is there any, anything called as uh, uh, AI-based tool to select the best tool site? Of course, again, it is dependent on the morphology itself, but any, this an, just add on to the regular conventional morphological grading, what we do under the microscope. This is something uh, like uh, different from that, right? So anybody is using AI-based tools to, uh, is there any, first of all, is there any tool? Or, and if, is, if it's so, anybody is using it? No. Tool is there. Tool is there. There tool is one company. That I think uh, that uh, I forget the name that company, but they are uh, uh, they are uh, uh, actually recently published uh, data on that also. But uh, we are not using that. What uh, What is it? So like uh, it is based on the morphology. AI, the AI, AI, AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Based on the picture, it is going to select yeah, the, uh, based based on the, the score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yes, so, robot it, team from Bangalore, they are actually they, uh, making a tool for this thing, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, they're working on uh, elasticity of the membrane, OLM membrane. And, okay. uh, and uh, usually now they succeed in the uh, no, robo called how to hold the oocyte, which is a minimum pressure. What uh, How we use in the general, uh, when doing XC, using the... Uh, no, lot of pressure, yes. Yeah, it will select, it will select by their size also, size yes. of the oocyte also. In, in those things, uh, yes, A is, you know, in the field, it is, we all know that it is our next feature to know uh, attribute intelligence. It is a tool, it will give in one picture, it will give everything, uh, the oocyte in the molecular level, everything. Now, uh, that is again a, that is again a debate because how much yeah. you rely on AI. This is again yes. a topic of next discussion because I don't believe at this stage, it's simply a data generated by a computer, which is relying on the images given by us. It is. It can't be sufficient enough. As <laughs> I, I don't know I, about the yeah, uh, I, 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 I would say there would be a lot of companies which would be really unhappy with what you are saying, and uh, <laughs> the world is world is world is going towards the direction of AI, and AI. probably it is very very nascent stage right now to say how AI works. Then we right? don't, you know, then we are, we we don't all, know the markers which we are putting into the AI system. We don't know what are the robust markers we are going to give them, and how can we? rely on those re results Pro until Pro unless we are not very sure <laughs> that Pro is the question Pro Pro that's how, probably that's that is the role role of ai is that's where it comes something which is beyond human capability something beyond which humans can but see like i said it's still an open question it's still an open question how much yeah. it will be but i think that is one of the steps in which probably the science is progressing ahead and uh, one of the tools where you remove the subjectivity of your grading where we have been continuously be talking in so many webinars over the subjectivity of the grading, let's say of the embryo or the sperm or the oocyte for that, say, probably AI may help a bit to make a level playing field. Let's see. I'm asked to answer. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. <laughs> but now, yeah, but now yeah, uh, we cannot answer the question, but, but maybe in the future, 
it could be we don't know because uh, it looks very promising because you're not uh, it is not a, a invasive technique as such so like you you're just taking the uh, pictures and just looking at yeah. the morphology yeah you're exactly. getting the probability that what this could be because this yeah. is again based on the lot of data that has been fed like machine learning yeah. has been happened based on those yeah. algorithms these are going to predict the uh, the score so probably yes uh, if it is effective why not so that will be a, a thing and uh, any other uh, 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 substandard uh, premium standards apart from uh, morphological grading i think the final gist of the answer is yes morphological grading is the gold standard which is available right now others are still in the development phase and a research phase still which time will say as such and fortunately or unfortunately we are stuck with it so you know you don't have a definitive answer for it. everyone whether it's good bad or ugly or it's really good so we still don't know and i think as of now the definitive uh, answer is morphological grading yes yes, yes. 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 can we move to the next question yes. yeah. akash please take the question sure. yeah yeah so uh, what nancy was saying something back so i want to know from individually do you do on a regular basis occ assessment in your lab and uh, how to what extent do you use it based on the grading do you make any decisions based on that actively or anything so we'll start with nancy for that case so i have already answered this in the previous question that uh, we do not uh, do the regular assessment of occ but definitely if you if, if we have something if we i see a, uh, the binary uh, scoring system we don't uh, do it but yes if i see something which is compacted i'm going to use it anyways i if i'm going for xc i'm going to review it and then see if it is mature or not it could be mature it could not be mature and uh, if i'm going for i if you know, definitely keeping it for the examination so um, yes uh, i'm doing okay. i'm not doing we'll, it we'll come back to that part uh, dr manisha uh yeah uh, as per our routine protocol we are uh, jotting down the occ compaction level if it is well radiated and it's fluffy so it gives a kind of concern okay we are expecting a good insight but uh, we may be uh, we may get surprises even in ivf lab so fine but we are actually mentioning it but uh, i have seen it is not creating much impact because at times as nancy have already uh, has uh, told us that even compacted occ has given us a good m2 site which turned out to be a good blastocyst so i can't say there uh, that there is a direct correlation or we can relate it but yes it as a habit because since ivf days we are trained to uh, we are trained to see the occ maturation radiation fluffiness so it has become a habit and we are mentioning it we are wait sir so as a routine i am not doing this is no. uh, occ no. assessment uh, but of course if i see something uh, different thing dark kind of tumular cells or different kind of uh, things definitely i'll check it or nowadays we are doing more of xcs so anyway we have to denude everything yeah. so it is like that so so coming to that part like we are going more towards xc so mm -hmm. i have my co moderator who does most of the cases ivf wherever possible so would it influence the decision change any time for any one of you if you see occs which look quite compacted and not expanded at all So yes. would it make any change yes, in your decision? Wait for some time. I think. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. If most of the OTCs are compacted, I'll go for IV. Yes. Go for XC. Yes. I'm sorry. Definitely. You That's go for XC or I? I compacted, not expanded. Not expanded. I will definitely go for XC. I'll denude it and I'll do XC. Because I come to know what is the problem with the oocyte. We can't leave it like that. Uh, okay, it will be fertilized or not. So okay, fertilization. We have tried that. We have. Cross that level. I'll do like see. Okay, Hemant and Bala, you can can we have uh, your hands? Yeah, actually, we have a practice of uh, assessing uh, OCC because uh, uh, though we are not doing uh, much IVF cases here, and we are not uh, taking as a predictive measurement uh, like uh, uh, depends on the OCC. We are not deciding any protocol like IVF or XC, but still uh, we will be like uh, getting to know uh, how to uh, at least like. from the basics if i want to say uh, we just come to know the uh, how to use the denudation uh, how we give pressure and all because uh, with the, uh, like if i am okay with this cumulus and well expanded and it's like good uh, so i can be uh, not worried to be like uh, 
uh, i'll be okay with that uh, o site will be m2 or uh, something will be good uh, so obviously and then we have a practice of uh, uh, like uh, seeing the history of patient and also the uh, uh, embryonic status and uh, o sites of uh, history of patient so that uh, will be like correlating with the uh, previous cycle if the patient uh, had Uh, so that we will be assessing the o size uh, sorry o c c okay hemant yes uh, i do follow the assessment of o c c uh, in uh, in my daily practice uh, because uh, this is how you know when clinicians is always uh, before the uh, op u she uh, she will tell this is a do- this much is a dominant follicles and this much is a uh, intermediate follicle in those cases i'll know i i do and uh, no i teach uh, my colleagues as well Uh, how the expansion is and how to know whether when you choose the techni- uh, technique or uh, technique like if you want to do xc or if you do ibf uh, definitely you should know the uh, occ grading that is a must for embryologist it is a it is a basic uh, no uh, education uh, to choose the technique whether you want to do xc or ibf uh, most of the time yes uh, no which is very distinct and be a previous patient having no having a, a lower fertilization rate or Uh, embryo development is not so great. We know in those cases uh, we are not going to take a chance. We go for ICSI, but it is a case tied. In those cases, you uh, know, uh, to choosing the IVF, uh, we look at the OCC, and depending upon that, you know, we uh, will see the what is the time of insemin or incubation we need to do. Uh, it is uh, uh, kernel rate is very well distinctive or it is very compacted. uh those decision definitely will change the uh, no uh, science will definitely de- uh, change the decision yeah shukla sir sorry guys so okay. yes sir uh, i have uh, been practicing uh, regular insemination ever since i learned how to do it and i still prefer to do it Uh, of course there are certain professional challenges and uh, pressures but still uh, but uh, uh, in my previous lab that i was a full timer so i had this habit to record each and every oocyte okay. so at that time uh, because we had certain criteria if we are addressing a non male factor couple okay. and if it is uh, their first cycle we would prefer to go for regular insemination ivf so in that case uh, whether the uh, occ is looking little compact or not so fluffy or cloudy still we would go for regular insemination and to my junior colleagues who are um, not um, um in tune with the regular insemination ivf you still get 70% fertilization okay. so um it's very thin line but still maybe because you have um, uh, an increased workload and you don't have all those things so uh, there is no harm uh, and in fact now it has become a law that you should have a witness so why mm-hmm. not have a, another colleague in uh, in your lab and just ask because i have seen this in many uh, overseas countries mm-hmm. where the chief embryologist used to dictate the uh, distinct features of the oocyte and the junior gets it noted down so i think the gist is we have a divided panel in terms of trees to achieve some do some don't do but the end of day noting may make no harm as such and it may helps in certain cases in deciding your denudation times you can postpone that because there's a biological variability with how each of the patient responds to this and not all occs might be equal so your denudation times can be postponed preponed or could be on time based on how mature they look based on the expansion little tiny many changes which you can make and probably which can help you decide better sometimes ivf versus ic may be helpful in some cases definitely not harmful at all and uh, this was the last question like are we seeing any changes in terms of the occ expansion you know earlier we used to see agonist cycles this nice fluffy looking cloudy uh, translucent kind of occs 
which probably with the advent of the antagonist cycle, which we are not looking at that much expanded ones, that fluffy kind. So is it just something which we have seen as moderators or, or others feel the same, the expansion of the OCCs, of the mature oocytes? I think uh, I haven't seen this kind of uh, that uh, thing. Much expansion, but like what we used to say, totally translucent, where, yeah. you know, with naked eye, you could make it out. Something is mature looking without under but the definitely microscope. definitely when uh, we uh, give trigger of antarc in this cycle, definitely I saw some difference uh, that uh, uh, the tubular cells are compact kind of, and sometimes it is dark. Uh, on trigger of like just uh, decapeptide trigger, I have seen so many cases like that. So sometimes I ask a clinician to which trigger you have given, deca is, is it decapeptide? So they say yes, decapeptide. So I don't know, but I have seen this kind of uh, features so that it is compact or sometimes it is dark uh, cumulus. I don't Relatively know. dark cumulus, but gives mature oocytes as such and yeah, good yeah, results. Mature, as well. mature oocytes. Mature oocytes. Shukla, sir, any views? Uh, can't, can't really comment on this because I haven't seen much difference. But uh, one thing which, uh, uh, let me quote uh, yesterday's case, where we had only three uh, OCCs and they all were looking very little. I mean, there was hardly any uh, cumulus. You can't see uh, cumulus in um, the entire follicular fluid. So you just can't say that the, the, the oocyte might have detached from the main cumulus mass. But there was no cumulus except the little tiny cumulus along with the oocyte. So as usual, my first um, intuition was that probably we'll get no mature oocyte. But to my surprise, all the three were mature. So uh, it's very difficult. And if I had delayed that denudation process based on this, so probably they might have overmatured. Yes. So it's very difficult. Uh, I mean, and for that, probably we again need uh, an AI. Okay. So looks can be deceptive and don't judge a book by its cover is what we have got the point over here. So anyone wants to add anything to this? Any of the panelists? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think uh, we can move on to the next question. Yeah. So the next question, our arrow will be uh, with respect to in vitro maturation. So yeah, we all know that like, you know, the male part is very rich in uh, with respect to gametes, there are millions, but with respect to the female, even though they're born, they were born now, uh, at the time of birth, there are millions, eventually they come down at the time of uh, puberty and they gradually decrease over the years. So each oocyte is very important for us. Like, you know, uh, the, the, the gamete part with respect to the female is more important. So in such scenarios, we have something called as uh, in vitro maturation. So uh, we just want to know about the, uh, how, how are this, the, what is the competence level of this IVM oocytes? Anyone can take up the question. You are talking about that uh, uh, aspirating oocyte at the size of 14 or 15 or you're talking about? Uh, we'll come into that later. Uh, mm -hmm. Rescue as well as uh, uh, standard, standard IVM. First, in, in general, uh, I'm talking about uh, the standard IVM, uh, yeah, standard IVM uh, protocols. What What is the competence of those IVM sites? So I have done few IVM uh, cycles uh, in past, uh, but uh, uh, the competence level is not so good in that uh, sites. I have done ICSI in those cases, but uh, their fertilization is low and everything is, uh, even the blastulation rate was also low in that cases. So I think uh, it is not so good, uh, the quality of oocyte from IBM. Maybe I have done few cases, that's why uh, uh, it is I have seen that. Okay, so okay. Hemant? Uh, yeah, this uh, I have also has a very limited uh, number of cases uh, done so far, only one or two. In those cases, in the compared to the you know uh, uh, IVF and IVM, in IVM was at what I found in, in the limited cases that uh, you know the population will be homogeneous. I never see the heterogeneous uh, cytoplasmic in uh, uh, IVM oocytes. 
that is the one uh, major uh, good findings we do uh, because you know uh, that we need to understand the embryology when it is a heterogeneous cytoplasm the holding of the oocyte and position of the aspiration that is very important uh, uh, as per concern in the uh, uh, IVF oocyte that cytoplasm will be homogeneous I never seen because I didn't saw very two, two or three cases I didn't so far in that that homo uh, cytoplasm homogeneity is uh, very good compared to, to the in the IVF oocyte okay uh, yeah, the paper says that uh, embryological outcome is lower in IVF, IVM oocytes. Uh, although uh, by practice, uh, there are uh, some uh, like in extension things that when we are doing uh, a normal uh, oocyte screening, uh, we will be in stick on sometimes and we will be like screening from the follicular and we will get the oocytes. But when we are doing IVM uh, oocyte screening and all, the procedure it will uh, itself take time. Uh, so the temperature, everything is matters on the, uh, in that criteria. So from my point, and when we are comparing all these things, that uh, clinical, uh, sorry, uh, embryonic outcome will be uh, lower uh, in terms of IVM oocytes. Okay, fine. I, I, have, I have little different opinion here. Sanket. Please, sir. Uh, I believe uh, our approach for IVM is still uh, maybe suboptimal. And uh, the way we are uh, improving our media and other things. So there are certain groups, especially in Japan and uh, some Italy, and they have achieved similar embryonic development rate as we do in our routine IVF with IVM. But the way they do IVM is different and therefore it is absolutely necessary to differentiate between rescue IVM and standard IVM. Uh, rescue IVM, uh, first of, uh, I mean, first of all, we need to know that the importance of cumulus is of paramount. The moment we stripped of the cumulus cells, the naked oocytes are very uh, uh, susceptible to any stresses. And what we usually do in rescue IVM is we are dealing with the naked uh, oocytes. So it is not true IVM. The, the uh, molecular dialogue, the biochemical dialogue between the cumulus cells and the processes from the cumulus cells that uh, pass through the zona and reach up to the ulema and communicate with the oocyte is such a wonderful phenomenon that there has developed that you can't match and rescue IVM is never be compared with the standard IVM. So like in earlier days, what we used to do is prepare our own IVM media using our own gonadotropin supplements and all those things. So that was not perfect thing. Again, priming with the gonadotropins, uh, priming with the HCG before we do IVM. There are several strategies and now there are certain groups, as I mentioned earlier, they are doing wonderful job with IVM, but it is not reproducible at every lab. So we still need to learn a lot. Yes, sir. Right, right. Wonderful, sir. And uh, uh, anybody else? Uh, Dr. Manisha, Nancy? Enough data. We are not doing much of IVM. We are not that successful. As uh, Sanjay sir has said, we need to learn more. Actually, we are in learning phase. So I can't comment on this at this point of time. <laughs> I don't have any experience. I'm sorry. No problem. Uh, Nancy? Uh, well, uh, yeah, you, you're, on, you're on mute. I'm saying I have not seen any case of IVM till late. Maybe I'm uh, the least experienced here. Uh, but uh, yeah, I I believe that what I have read, the standard IVM is definitely um, a step ahead than the rescue IVM. And IVM is, is a step behind than the normal IVF, what we are doing. Right. As a... Dr. Sanjay sir rightly said, yeah, there's a huge difference between uh, standard IVM as well as rescue IVM, firstly. 
secondly uh, the, the the very protocol for the standard review is such that we don't uh, tease the uh, they're in dialogue continuous dialogue with the uh, primordial i mean for i mean granulosa cells and there is a lot of uh, changes that is going to happen which which is supported by them but here since we, it has already been denuded and we it is called as forced uh, ivm as far as a feel because uh, just because you have denuded the uh, COCs and you get to see that it is GV or M1, you are forced to keep because there is a less number of oocytes or depending upon the uh, case case scenario, whether uh, you have uh, surface oocytes or not. So uh, yes, the outcomes, uh, as uh, Sanjay sir mentioned, there are some groups which are shown that uh, there are optimal results with like when compared to the uh, routine IVF uh, outcomes. But Again, the point of reproducibility comes into the picture, which most of us is not able to, I mean, reproduce the same results as, as of those groups. And I think, yeah, uh, it is in the nascent stage or not. I don't know as of now, is even uh, as uh, all the panelists will agree with this, uh, it, it is not. But uh, maybe uh, if you look at those studies which uh, which have which have come out with uh, those groups and if you look at their results we don't feel that it is in still in, in its uh, nascent stage but uh, again it is not uh, you no know, reflecting in all the labs right so it's again it's the, this is a question which is currently cannot be answered and uh, having said that next question will be on the zona pellucida so uh, what what is the physiological role of uh, zona pellucida Dr. Manisha, you're on mute, I think. Uh, Dr. Manisha, you're, you're mute. Okay. It has already been answered by the previous speakers because zona pellucida, the layer uh, which is responsible for the uh, acrosomal reaction for uh, uh, to prevent the cell from polyspermy. And so it is actually the first layer where uh, sperm and oocyte interaction take place. So a physiological uh, uh, role we have already discussed. And uh, the importance, as long as it is, uh, you wanted to ask about the importance of zona pellucida, definitely we have seen uh, that uh, four different glycoprotein, they have an uh, important role in fertilization. Uh, so it is definitely an important part and we need to look at it at the time uh, of doing insemination or injections. So, Yes, uh, uh, wait, sir. What do you think about uh, the role of zona pellucida? How important it is uh, to look at the... Uh, yes, as Dr. Manisha already told everything and previous speaker also told about the acrosome reaction and zona binding, sperm binding on these kind of things. Definitely there is role of zona pellucida. Even, uh, 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 you know, that selection of uh, oocyte quality and everything uh, also uh, there is a role of zona pellucida. So physiological role is definitely is there for that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, specifically that uh, fertilization uh, things and every, all the activities. Uh, Mr. Bala? Uh, I, I would like to extend this question to Usaid, uh, from Usaid to embryo. So while selecting the embryos also, we'll be considering this zona, pellucida that <clears throat> thickness of the ZP. So... Uh, because uh, that oocyte part, everyone has covered nicely. So we got to so many information. So uh, ZP has a, um, a role in uh, selection of embryos also. Right, right. Uh, Hemant, what do you what do you like to say about uh, ZP? Yes, uh, we know the the roles and importance of zona pellucida. Uh, mainly, it acts as a receptor uh, where it will bind the uh, uh, sperm to the oocyte. And uh, other main important role in the zona pellucida, you know, exists that is the uh, inducers of the acrosomal reaction mm -hmm. and mainly the prevention of polyspermy. This is all the know and already all the two other, uh, uh, other early speakers have explained uh, detail about uh, extracellular uh, setup and futures. futures. Um, uh, I think this, this, is, the, this, is, this is it. Uh, Sanjay sir and uh, Nancy. Uh, it is uh, uh, it is a pro protective coat of hair that everyone has told and uh, it prevents polyspermy will give you specific specificity and it will also uh, help in uh, the cell signaling pathways mm -hmm. uh, can regulate the uh, cell uh, signals and definitely can help in uh, further activation of uh, the oocyte and the acrosomal reaction yeah uh, and also uh... 
Yes, the transportation. And uh, yeah, first mainly is the uh, if you look at the zona, it starts from the follicular genesis. It, it is there from that from that point of time, and it is carried out till the blastocyst. Once they, when the embryo gets hatches, till then it has been covering the embryo, the nurturing the embryo, and it actually it, act, it acts as a protective barrier. The first thing, and second most thing will be the yes, whatever the receptor are based on that. Yeah, the most important uh, event that occurs the, that is fertilization is because of the receptors based on the uh, zona pellucida, ZP1, yeah. ZP2, ZP3, whatever the glycoproteins which are there. That is most important. That uh, and coming to that, followed this the cascade of events. It also prevents the polyspermy. The cortical granules coming and sitting over there, and uh, no hardening zona hardening, which happens at the time of uh, the sperm entry. Uh, after the sperm entry, will also act. You uh, know, it acts as a uh, barrier for the polyspermy. And also, there are a lot of transport that happens between because it also is a membrane, right? A lot of things will come in. A lot of vesicle-based things, the cargo, which has been uh, the the communication that happens from the uh, developing oocyte and the outside environment is through the zona again. And the size and thickness again, yes, it varies from oocyte to oocyte and embryo to embryo. Which is also is a paramount important and similarly the thickness is also like is a good is it good the thickness the thicker the zona is it good or the thinner the zona is it good of course yeah, yeah we get to see the zona thinning at the time of blastocyst where it, before it before it just hatches the zona like gets thinned mm -hmm. so yes all these points are there so zona is not that uh, thing which we got to ignore yes it is most important and uh, having said that yeah uh, akash please take up the question Oh. Dr. Akash? Yes, yeah, sorry. Awesome. Just to add on that, uh, you know, Zona, we are probably bypassing by we have put on this. Is, there are so many roles which a Zona plays when it comes to a normal fertilization without ART. Without mm -hmm. ART. So there's yeah. so much of role which is being played, but we are probably bypassing it to a large extent, especially when we are going in for ICSI. And that's why we probably don't see role importance as such because you are taking a sperm, putting it directly inside the cytoplasm. But otherwise, for a normal sperm, when it uh, sorry, for a sperm to fertilize it with, if I say without assisted reproduction techniques, then it has to cross through this barrier, which would be the first one. Mm -hmm. Speciation has been told about, right? Species specific. You know, uh, aquatic animals they just lay their eggs outside, and there would be sperms of all sorts of species going around over there, right? And uh, the sperm only from this particular species can come and actually fertilize it. And they're about your the species to species. And there are some papers which say that your egg and the sperm, they are mutating this recognition, species recognition molecules are evolving at a much more rapid rate compared to your normal mutation, which is going on and something called as concerted evolu evolution, which is happening over there. Your dimeric, heterodimeric in terms of your zona pellucida is there. Your polymerization is over there, which is happening. Your slow polyspermy block is happening. So probably it's not happening. Zona is not happening in ART, but it's quite happening in the nature. So with that, Dr. One, Ash, I would yeah. like to ask one thing here because uh, yeah. so many experts are here. Um, uh, does anybody consider zona thickness before opting for any IVF or I, uh, ICSI? Like uh, if a zona is very thick and then we uh, one should go for ICSI or we can do with uh, we can go ahead with IVF. Like Sanjay sir and all seniors are here. I really want to. Yeah, what happens is we don't get to see zona as such in with uh, with with respect to IVF insemination. Hardly we get to see because it is surrounded with the criminal cell. Yeah, so that is again, uh, yeah, which we cannot clearly distinguish the proper zona uh, appearance. So probably yes, with XC yes, it is very much understood. We we, we get to see that, but uh, yes, in IVF. Uh, again, as we discussed, the expansion of oocytes, which plays an important role there. Whether mm -hmm. we can get access through the uh, appearance of the zona or not. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I feel. Okay, and uh, how about uh, because uh, there are uh, uh, have, we have seen contradictory opinions. Like few people are saying thin zona is good. Uh, can uh, with thin zona oocytes can give us good fertilization. Where are, where is the there there is a, a paper by Dr. Rama Raju in which they have clearly mentioned that thick zona has uh, more uh, developmental potential in the oocyte. So what is the consensus here? <laughs> what so, so if I if I if I can add to your previous question, yeah. So yeah. we do split C for okay. patients. So okay. we, I have not seen any correlation whatsoever. This is my personal experience, not okay. from any paper. That is important. Uh, not, not anything in terms of thick zona. Uh, mm -hmm. We had, I had two cases which I remember there, which was more thicker than near 20 microns, where they usually take 18 microns as the limit. 
for yeah. consider it as thick zona more than 20 microns also it does not matter in terms of fertilization rate and like the paper which i have quoted about uh, ramarajo et al yes right. it has clearly so it has clearly shown because yeah. probably there's a variability to it which we don't understand and when it is not thin when it is rather too thin probably you are subjecting the oocytes to much more insults outside if you consider in terms of protective barrier. That is my understanding of it. But there so, is a, one previous paper where they have quoted if it is below 12 mm, it is good. So it was, I have seen quite contradictory opinions yes. studying for this thing. So I really... Uh, I think, I think we need large, large, large RCTs based on that uh, ZP. I so that agree. can come to come and to come to a conclusion. I think the data which is put forth, I think is not sufficient because uh, the, 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 the results are contradictory. ZP has got more so role to play in IVF and we can't and assess ZP in an IVF cycle. Probably that's the paradox over there. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the person who does more ICSI is more uh, right person to answer this because they get to see a lot of different uh, type of zonas, right? The thickness of zonas. Yeah. So, uh, arrow number seven, please, Akash. So, yeah. so something related to zona size, we are saying, so rather than zona size, if you can comment, is there any ideal oocyte size which would be targeting it when we see post denudation? Yes, we know there is a Jane two site. Yes, those are one category which are at the one extreme of it present. But is there any ideal oocyte size? Uh, hey, man? I, say, I say ideal oocyte size. Yes, uh, we know yes. that you know, the normal uh, oocyte shape will come on uh, come up to one ten to one thirty micrometer in size, and uh, which is more than one fifty or more 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 than one thirty five or one fifty micrometer. That is called Jane two site, which is having the chromosome abnormality. But while doing ICSI, it is no, most of the time it is very rare uh, to find uh, uh, differentiate each oocyte having the same uh, size of the uh, oocyte size even doing the, when I mean, we performing the ICSI. But many uh, now literatures and you no know, article says, I mean, searching for you know, yesterday, then what is the, what is the actual oocyte size? Because I, it was never, I never thought about it. I always you know, mind, you know, okay, giant oocyte, we think on, or in this very small oocyte, then what what is the actual size uh, of the oocyte when performing? The, is there any particular size they mentioned? But uh, as we look at the data, uh, in they come on they are saying one ten to one twenty micrometer, or yeah. some of the, some of the data says one thirty micrometer is uh, you know uh, uh, having a good um, uh, embryo, embryology, embryological development uh, takes place, which is uh, micrometer. It is one thirty. Well, how would it be correlated? How would you correlate in terms of how why size would be important? Say 120, 130 microns is a size where you'd expect better embryological outcomes as such. No, but why would size be important? They're working in the different sizes from 110, one, they took it in 100 micrometer, 110 micrometer, 120, 130. In that the site, the larger larger of the cytoplasm, they calculate the larger of the cytoplasm, not complete the oocyte. The larger of the cytoplasm, which is coming up to 130 micrometer, having a good prognosis of embryo development. That is, they are finding in the in this study. Okay. Bala, you. Uh, I don't have any specific comment okay. on this. Shukla Savet, sir. Yes, 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 sir. So, uh, very good, Hemant. You have mentioned this uh, size limit. Again, mm -hmm. another group from Asada Clinic in Japan. Uh, led by Hiroyo Kitasaka, they have published a beautiful, I mean, in my opinion, it is probably a game-changing uh, study, mm -hmm. which was published uh, in Fertility Sterility Sciences last February. And they say that anything which is one third, more than 130 micron or equal to 130 micron is a giant oocyte. And this statement is very bold because we know the giant oocytes are deployed. So, mostly deployed. Polyploid, yeah. so it's not just the, uh, I mean, morphometric uh, assessment, but they went on to see the spindle through the birefringence and poloscopy. And then they proved that, yes, I mean, they have studied more than 2.5 lakhs oh oocytes. And their incidence of such uh, giant oocytes was 0.22%. So uh, it's not just this thing. 
they even went ahead further ahead and they studied uh, with the fluorescent microscopy they studied the spindle size they studied the metaphase plate distance and with all this they gave two uh, this thing because we all know there are two side uh, two types of giant oocytes one with just one polar body and which looks absolutely like an m2 oocyte and another is with two polar bodies so we know that these are the uh, uh, giant oocytes so in obviously we assume that if we have a two polar body giant oocyte there must be two spindles and we have uh, m2 like of giant oocytes so it should have just one spindle so they showed that the giant oocytes like according to their definition which is more than 130 micron if it has one spindle it is large in size and if it has two spindles they are normal in size but since there are two spindles so obviously it's a diploid oocyte and therefore to me and again okay so i'm i'm forgetting another um, uh, observation of theirs so they zoomed the you know nucleus uh, i mean the spindle and they studied the kinetochore also and they found that it is double in number almost double most of the time so average kinetochore number that they counted is something around 86 so this is mind boggling study <laughs> so i believe if we use something very good uh, imaging system and um, connected with artificial intelligence and if that things the moment we put the oocyte in the focus and it says no bhaiya ye to zyada bada hai isko hata do so we can avoid many aneuploidies i mean why we go for embryo selection we can select the oocyte itself with the, uh, <laughs> yes yeah. very informative sir very so it is it is really wonderful wonderful paper wonderful and scary sir actually <laughs> what it tells us is what it tells me is by the study you quoted uh, the study has been done very meticulously sir like you no know, they started with one question and they expanded to the next question and they 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 took it in a uh, such a fashion that step by step and at the end they concluded that the, whatever the bold statement they made mm-hmm. uh, the oocytes which are 130 or uh, more than 130 or giant oocytes i think uh, with the number of oocytes what they have studied i think uh, it makes sense yes. true yeah. i think uh, that's How? once again uh, yeah nancy go ahead so uh, this is very difficult to you know how could you uh, differentiate between 130 and 135 or 140 your micropipette micropipette denuding pipette yeah, yeah, but 140 if you are using and you have sir is saying that anything above 130 if it is 135 will it not so here, 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 here comes the, the uh, role of okay. artificial intelligence yeah, that's what sir is saying not everyone not everyone is having it right now and now it is so scary whenever we no. are going to see something like this it will always come to the mind that uh, is there is something which is abnormal or are we doing something uh, are we injecting something which is abnormal just to answer so- anthes question uh, yeah there is see there is something called as uh, uh, cytometry where you can measure even a single cell but uh, i agree i agree with your question because we don't do that in uh, regular practice that's right yeah so we yes, it becomes uh, very difficult to choose which is 130 exactly and more less than 130 which is more than 130 and less than 130 yes in that case i think we have to follow uh, something called a cytometry for each oocyte then go for uh, ic <laughs> i think i think we can have a micrometer microscope based on that ip is based micrometer where we just see it is there i know i know not very this is just, this is, it. This is just a just a immediate answer what i could think of like yeah. uh, while servers going on about there could be so much variability with just within say 5 to 10 microns so you can have a say micrometer which is based a line which is based on there and at least it gives you some idea rather we, than in the dark we have a simple solution akash we can use yeah. 130 micrometer we we should yeah. start with 130 micrometer 130. you know but then something but then, start fitting it But then your denudation <laughs> pressures. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Please, your microbiome yeah. denuding the bed size. Yeah. So that we get higher. 
property and uh, start culturing matlab uh, i'm going to implement this thing i'll start culturing those things in a separate droplets and uh, jotting yes. down those things because but that would be the reason behind uh, so much uh, fertilization failure <laughs> this is really thought provoking <laughs> only thing for me would be i would be not comfortable with the 130 microns yeah. but we can always used to check it i would be rather more comfortable with 140 140 the damage damage to the sites would go up second second after uh, stripping off the cumulus cell then you can uh, yeah. pass you can it through one for it check you can check still, <laughs> yeah. yeah i know we have to start it's, with it's kind of dicey kind of dicey over there practice changing yeah, you must say practice changing but possible yeah There's a word of caution, Manisha here. Yeah. Is that the 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 micro? Uh, I mean, the denuding pipettes that we are using. Yeah. They are not precisely one thirty or one forty micro. Keep is this. Here comes. Okay. Here comes. Yes, that is also there. <laughs> so just don't rely on this. <laughs> well, uh, going to next question. Uh, i think this has been already discussed with respect to the pvs the size and shape and the debris in that and the significance so we'll skip this question yeah uh, akash you want to take the question so uh, one more kind of worms what we don't know what we don't see ploidy status of our site and this has got more to do with the root cause as such rather than how do you assess uh, this question is at what stage does it arise at what stage would the uh, aneuploidy arise in a oocyte what are the common stages at which steps it would it would form from a, say a, it would change from being a euploid to a aneuploid in a meiotic first you have one more question left yeah meiotic yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes at this stage of meiotic yes is one Meiosis one, meiosis two, at both the stages, and you plus can arise. There will be segregation. There will be there is segregation. Segregation. Could be a segregation error, or then could be a any problem. Uh, which would be more important? Uh, yeah. Which is the most responsible one? Uh, the one. 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 Uh, post meiotic. Um, I think both are equally important. You can't say one is more important. Something wherever wherever it has happened, it is going to create an impact, and it could happen. No, it, it, I'm not saying which one will create more impact in terms mm-hmm. of an individual oocyte, but as such, when you see total your cycle as such, or you see across patients, which stage is more responsible for causing any problems? Is it meiosis one, meiosis two? Early cleavage, later cleavage. So, meiosis one. Meiosis one as such. Meiosis one as such, which is responsible majority of it. Yes, and meiosis two less less as such. Yes, because and there is um, a segregation of the sister chromatids there. So sister chromatids yeah, over there, and it would be more in terms uh, when it's in mitosis, say post meiotic, it would rather give rise to more chances of mosaicism. Mm-hmm. Yes, always the chance of uh, self correction and all those things would be there. Yeah. But still, it would result in mosaicism and aneuploidy per se. If you say it would be meiosis one, would be the one. Unknown color. Next question is like, what oocyte factors uh, are responsible for fertilization failure other than nuclear immaturity? Oocyte activation. Oocyte activation. Uh, okay. Um, like. Uh, if you are talking about total fertilization failure, so it could be um, uh, or other than that um, um, male factor. It could be from the sperm side and uh, um, something or uh, total uh, because otherwise total fertilization failure is something which we very rarely got to see. Actually, we get poor fertilization rate and for which oocyte can be responsible. But total fertilization failure, if a uh, uh nuclear immaturity is not there then would probably the oocyte activation factors they could be the responsible factors so so you get a patient of tff mm-hmm. okay patient wants to go ahead with the next cycle and uh, they say this is our last cycle we can't afford another cycle but mm-hmm. we would like at least one of the gametes to be related to the couple as such so which oocyte which gamete would you advise to change In the practical scenario and the acceptance of the patient, 
and it is very difficult to say <laughs> if you are talking about the practical scenario in indian scenario people always uh, prefer to stick to this farm they they opt for, they they are usually opt for opted for the usai donors but i don't know now what is going to happen <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, it, uh, the question was actually for individual lucite level what is it but uh, like said tff we have a very well defined one plc zeta is the one which can if there is deficiency of it acrosomal one globospermia so very few cases where we can say for sure this is the case yeah. with, which is responsible as such uh, but at lucite level individually one is nuclear maturity no doubt see that because if it, it's going not going to be m2 lucite it's Uh, chances of fertilization will definitely be lower okay. definitely be low other than that anything else other than the cytoplasmic factors anything which is causing causing to have a no fertilization akash again the question of xc and ivf comes in picture so if we are saying because to to me it's the gold standard the regular insemination ivf the or even the natural ivf like no, not not natural ivf but natural fertilization so we don't know much about the things which are happening inside the body but whatever we have learned from the animals and uh, other species there are certain mutations that alter the behavior of zona so they don't allow these sperms to enter or they don't adhere to the sperms or there are uh, scarcity of the markers or the total uh, absence of the markers so they don't fertilize because there is no entry of sperms but as far as the xc is concerned uh, there are several other factors also it's not just the uh, uh, i mean the um, how do you inject the sperm um but that that should not lead to a total fertilization failure that may be uh, some uh, oh, uh individual cases or the isolated cases but uh, as you are showing here if there are uh, <laughs> mitochondrial insufficiency in the uh, outside so this would lead to the um less uh cyclic amp and uh, uh other pathways the atp generation and therefore um there may not be the the whole uh machinery not working in tandem with the fertilization and uh because i have experience with the failed fertilization uh, oocytes which were then studied with the confocal microscopy and uh, uh normos uh, sorry um gm size staining also and then we found that uh, there are sperms that entered but they failed to condense so or the the even the con- uh, decondensed sperms but then they f- failed to further activate the sperms so lack of uh, you know the oocyte activation factors like uh, uh, calcium I yeah. I, no, I mean the PLC zeta and other things, and uh, sometimes even the sperms they lack the, the meta um, mitosis promoting factors. So all these things uh, you do not know with just looking at the uh, failed oocytes. Uh, I mean failed fertilized oocyte. and also sir uh, just to extend the point uh, yesterday we came across a paper where uh, we read about acrosome reaction uh, much before uh, the spermatozoa reaches the zona pellucida even though there is acrosome reaction is over even after that they are able to fertilize and you know uh, allow the embryo to develop but that is a very rare thing which we get to see because as, as far as we know the acrosome reaction is very much needed at the, at the point of zona just to penetrate the spermatozoa inside the zona but those spermatozoa which already this has been lost the acrosome reaction even they are able they are capable of you no know, they are able to fertilize the oocyte 
which is a very rare study we went to see yesterday and we discussed more about it and let us not go into details about it and uh, as rightly said yes cytoplasmic immaturity and uh, male factor thing and potential mitochondrial insufficiency premature uh, chromatin condensation because we get to see there are uh, four times condensation decondensation happens initially with the protein and histones where in the spermatozoa it decondenses and again it is condensed with the proteins it is replaced with the proteins again at the time upon the entry into the oocyte again this uh, condens this this, uh, this you know they undergoes again decondensation where again they are replaced with the histones and again condensation occurs so it is like series of condensation and decondensation which are replaced with a series of proteins like histones and proteins and any change with this also will affect the fertilization so absolutely, absolutely because yeah. we call it the cascade of fertilization yes correct correct so uh, everything should go uh, in a very well orchestrated way orchestrated way so that any one 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 failure of any one event will eventually lead to the fertilization failure. Failure. Uh, I, i like the word which uh, sanjay sir has used orchestrated way because it's actually a orchestra which is playing out it is yes. not one after the other chemicals but it is like you know the egg the fusion of the sperm no it is start the release of this yeah yeah i'm i'm starting with there yeah. like i'm starting from the point of fusion yes before yes. that it's the uh, ph20 and the hyaluronic acid those molecules causing the uh, dissolution of the hyaluronic acid mm -hmm. bases the sperm passes through inside okay. gets it as species a specific attachment to the zona binding acrosomal reaction happening over there the sperm passing through the fusion of the ulema and the sperm which is still very much not known what actually are the uh, receptors or there yes some transmembrane proteins are there proponents and those but still we are not very sure about those mm -hmm. and then the it gets engulfed inside then you have your decondensation happening over here, your proteins getting replaced by your histones happening over here your rearrangement of the organelles happening over here and simultaneously you have a metaplase to oocyte the spindle which is having its own trajectory to follow the polar body to being extruded out again it is forming then all these things happening simultaneously so no, no, again so much of zeta plc zeta. Zeta. zeta yes yes coming to plc zeta over there then it could cause activation calcium exocytosis uh, sorry extrudation from the er then you'll be having your anaphase promoting complex which gets broken down and then it will call resumption of your meiosis so it is a orchestra it is so many things going on simultaneously so we are still probably at the tip of the probable iceberg in terms of what causes fertilization failure though we are seeing 70 80% of our oocytes getting fertilized in ivf but remaining 20% is still a vast open area as to what is causing this fertilization failure Yeah, having said that, I think yeah, we're done with the questions, and uh, we thought yesterday we were doing some research on this oocyte evolution of oocyte and all. Then we got very important questions, like which we thought we'll mention this in the panel, so that this is the where uh, this is the places where the actual research is happening with respect to the evolution of oocyte and the uh, the the modes of fertilization. So, like, have you ever wondered the oocytes of humans and mammals adapted? When did this adapt to the internal fertilization? As we get to see, you know. in the ocean uh, as we already discussed akash has rightly mentioned that uh, external fertilization happens most of the times where uh, the the ocean or the water acts as a, a medium uh, for the spermatozoa for the gamete to reach the oocyte and fertilize eventually but when did this internal fertilization thing came into picture nobody knows about it still a lot of research is going on this and similarly uh, the million dollar question the egg laying or live birth which is first so how, how does the evolution chooses this and i know i know the answer Yeah, so it, is started, it is started in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. And uh, evolutionary values wise, they say it is the egg one, and then the uh, life birth happened. It is from the egg because uh, they correlate with this the the very ancestor of us. It is called as the uh, uh, winged a uh, winged uh, fish or something where. Uh, it is the first ancestor for the vertebrates and invertebrates, which evolved. Which it was earlier. It was egg-laying mammal. Sorry, egg-laying uh, fish, which evolved eventually to a uh, mammal. I mean, fish that gave us its birth to the live birth. So that that switching over, nobody knows when exactly happened. Maybe probably it was half a billion years ago. So which is a very long period. So that was on I think one of the oldest fossils as we get to see. And uh, so what is this primordial reason for this split? You uh, know. Uh, reproductive dichotomy between the uh, vivi parity as well as vivi parity still research is happening in this way uh, in these areas and when and why did 
the life of evolve uh, this is already discussed what is the reason what was the driving force for the uh, uh, nature uh, to adapt to the live birth rate live birth uh, process when compared to the egg laying process so what, what what could be a reason probable reason uh, research is also happening in this areas having said that uh, Yes, uh, nature will never invest its single atom of energy into something that is not productive. Nature remains the greatest and the best creator of all the time. And the good, bad and ugly is just a various degrees of classification, which are most mainly human made. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, yeah. uh, thank you Sanket. And uh, if you. I may add to it, I would like to thank all my panelists for wonderful answers. And, and what we had tried to bring out through this panel is we might be reading about in terms of whenever we see of oocyte quality, we tend to correlate it only with the nuclear maturity or probably the cytoplasmic features uh, over there, but there's much more to it. There's much more to it than what we tend to restrict ourselves to. We have seen to the panel that hardly we have discussed about those points in this panel, but majority was about something else features and which do matter, which do have a role to play. And the, nothing is definitive over here. There's nothing which is definitive that this is good or bad. So nature does not work that way. Nature does not work in terms of good, bad, or ugly. It just works. This is good. How is good? It does not waste anything. So when nature does not discriminate based on how the oocyte looks like, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, so neither should we humans discriminate, neither in the lab for using it, with certain exceptions, yes. And I would like to finish it with, if you ask, anyone like any mother which is the most beautiful child you know the best answer for this would be the answer would come immediately it's mine so probably none of the oocyte is bad good bad or ugly with that i would like to close yeah, it's a very human made, human made thing well said, well said, uh, well said, yeah, thank you. very human made thing because uh, yeah uh, we categorize it according to our convenience so nature doesn't you uh, know discriminate anything with as such good bad and ugly it's a beautiful session, uh, uh, Dr. Sanket and Dr. Akash. And it's quite thought-provoking because uh, we were uh, limited to the take-home um, uh, practical tips and tricks. And I'm glad to see that you are discussing beyond that. This is a very good initiation and very thought-provoking session. Thank you. Yeah, one more thing I would like to mention. We read about something called as the three-toed skink, where yes. uh, earlier it was a egg-laying mammal. Again, it converted at some point of uh, evolution. It converted to... Uh, uh, the one uh, live, no, birds. Live, bird, no, live birds, live birds. Uh, then what happened was mm -hmm. one extreme fossil, which the scientists were discovered was they identified a fossil where they get to see two eggs plus mm -hmm. one live birth. Mm -hmm. In the so, same cycle, in the same so, litter, you know, so, wow. yeah, something in the same litter. One, litter. One, one, one developing baby, which is already there as a normal developing hatchling and other one, other one are in egg stage. So what they concluded is maybe, uh, the nature is going back from egg laying, no? Like birth, evolution like, can't egg. always be single-sided. It can be both sided. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so, so many things which actually <laughs> we learned during designing of the panel as well. I mean, we were really we mind-boggled. We, 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 we lost the thing and we started reading about evolution. We went to so deep that we started about searching ZP proteins, evolution of ZP proteins, evolution of this uh, OV parity and EVV parity. Then we thought, no, no, we'll have to come back. We have to finish the questions. Tomorrow we have a panel to discuss. Then that's how it happened yesterday. <laughs> Thank you, Bala, and thank you, Dr. Manisha, for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. It was well organized. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hemant. Thank you. 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 And please block your dates, 14 to 16 April. It will be for limited uh, persons. And there will be uh, 14 experts from uh, national or we are trying to get some international uh, trainers also. And uh, uh, there will be more focus on hands-on training with minimum theory. And uh, there will be uh, all type of micro manipulator uh, to learn about hands-on practice. And you will get course material and as well as a uh, certificate of attendance. So uh, uh, this is the date, 14 to 6 in April. Whoever is interested, please, uh, you can contact on below uh, email address on phone number. And uh, 
yeah, of course, uh, Dr. Sanjay ji, please. Vote of thanks. Huh? So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, uh, Dr. Ved. And um, I'm sure everyone must have enjoyed uh, the entire session, uh, have learned a lot of things which are new, which are coming up. Our uh, these uh, youth brigade, as always they do, they have put on, um, put in a lot of efforts to research themselves first and then prepare the program. And the entire team of IHERA is uh, deeply indebted to all the participants, uh, our uh, speakers, our panelists, and our sponsor, uh, especially Nikhil and his team. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you Nakul. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. You, thank, you, thank, you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you. Nikhil ji, Nikhil ji, what was the uh, live number at the time of panel? Uh, just Mayan, can you? If you can stop the online, if you can go offline. Please stop recording. Anyone from RX event? Thank you. We are still online or we are offline? We are still live. No, no, we are still live.